I guess I, I see a lot more bow hunters than I ever have. Crossbow I see hunters. Fewer gun hunters. Yeah, 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 archers. We'll call them archers. Yeah. You can call them archers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Heck yeah, man. Dude, we put a lot of food in the ground every year, you know, seemingly more and more, and uh, we have a ton of fun with it during the off season. Uh, there's some struggles that come with it too, though, right? Obviously, the back of my truck is evidence, you know, right now. It's mm-hmm. a couple of weeks after uh, I jackknifed, you know, a 4 800 pound uh, material spreader, you know, as I was coming down, and it's just it was too much weight for my truck there. But, you know, all those struggles aside, you know, dude, Deer Grow really has been a staple for our food plotting process uh, for several years now. Yes, we like to put lime and fertilizer on the plots, you know, if we can, but there are some that it's just we're not able to get to them or it's not feasible for us to get out of state with that stuff and so deer grow is kind of the, the quick and easy but still super effective option for us to be able to get the most out of those food plots that we can every year and i mean we're guilty of over analyzing things just like everyone else but that's the best part about deer grow is that it's going to create healthier soils which in turn makes better food plots and the fact is is we can simply spray plot start or plot till when we put the seed in the ground and then when that plant starts to grow we hit it with boost and we know that we walk away when we come back it's going to be a great looking food plot for anybody that's looking to try deer grow if you use the code hunter 15 that's h-u-n-t-r-1-5 at checkout for deergrow.com and save 15 percent on any of your deer grow products it's a great way to get started on this and just see what the results are for yourself better food plots bigger deer and we're back hey hunter podcast episode whoa nice snack 159 <laughs> Hey, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, whether you're listening on uh, YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcast, we appreciate you listening. And uh, if you want to click that subscribe button or leave us a comment, uh, we do read those from time to time. Was that a, a, I don't know. a, a uh, spanking noise? Yes, yeah, spanking the subscribe do, button, I guess. We do read those from time to time, and uh, we appreciate you guys listening. So. We do. Uh, it is the last day in November. Fuck, it is depressing. Is it really? Holy it shit. Is. Oh. Oh. Well, it's been fun. Yeah. <laughs> see you guys next week. Yeah, we'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, last week. Uh, yeah, it's like Jared's worst day. It's the last day of November. Yeah. Gun seasons are full blazing. Like, I can just hear deer dying all around them. Uh, you know, it's not been as bad oh. as it has the past couple of years. Not as depressing. For a couple of reasons. You've killed a bunch? I've killed a couple, <laughs> and that's helped. Uh, we've diversified. Right, we bought the farm in Illinois, which you know, frankly, for all the reasons we're about to talk to, that's why. Yeah. Although uh, all the deer are dead out there too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, there's that. But I, I tagged out. We killed three I'm of them out. though. I'm, so. I'm tagged out. So. Yeah. Uh, and three, we've had uh, we got a lot more standing corn at the farm than we ever have. Yeah. Interesting. I was telling you earlier. So uh, Winky and I were texting. So Winky put this uh, whitetail watch out mm, yesterday, I think. And the big kind of thing was like, he's not seeing deer and he's got, got fields of standing corn and, and brassica. And he's like, just no deer and attributing it to this, this large acorn crop that we've had. And I think it, to add on, I don't know if he mentioned it. <clears throat> it. In fact, Emily was the one who said it to me. I'm seeing the same thing in my Kentucky place. Like I've got all this food standing. Normally my properties have no food at this point, so I'm used to not seeing deer, but I've got all this food standing. I've got, and just no deer. And, um, in Iowa, obviously Kentucky as well, we've been, we've gotten these really dry streaks. Uh, and typically those acorns rot as moisture kind of sinks in. And so I think with being as dry as we've been in a lot of these places, these acorns have stayed viable for longer as a food source for the deer. Um, because I've killed several, in fact, Emily killed a doe on Monday. I think was loaded with fat. It was like unbelievable how much fat was on these deer. So I think these deer are just consuming so many acorns and staying healthier that they're not going to the food sources that are standing right now, yeah. or at least as, as much as you would think. Pair that with, we basically just got our first cold weather the other day, and now it's back to like 55 or something. Yeah, looking like a pretty mild December. So, I mean, it, when you have those, like, it's like, man, all of that work I do is for this late season food source. Well, we just had a booming acorn crop. It's 50 plus degrees. Like, the deer just don't have to utilize it as hard as they need. And it makes it, doesn't make it any worse for the deer. It just makes them harder to kill and mm-hmm. see. 
Yeah. Um, and they're going to go into this winter in much better condition, which is great for next yeah. year. You got to be grateful for years like that. I mean, the, for face value, it's like, boy, the hunting is kind of suck. You know, some people might say that. Uh, but big picture, you know, it's like, yeah, but you know, some of these deer are going to get through, you know? Oh yeah. So with our stand in corn and stuff in Ohio, granted it's starting to come down right now mm -hmm. and there's still some gun seasons left, but, um, I'm feeling okay yeah. about it. Like, good. you know, yeah, there's, we've got, I've got a couple, three, four year olds, you know, that mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still hoping we'll make it through. And so it's like, okay, there's hope. How, what was, you had that 10 point show up. Is that a four or five year old? Yeah. It looks, it looks five to me. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Very cool. Just got the one picture. He must have followed. Dude, I, he was with that four-year-old. that Right I sent, behind the house. Yeah, and that I sent you. That's the same eight point yeah. that was on the tin shed gas line. Pretty far away. <laughs> like two hours before. There had to be a doe coming in yeah. over there. Yeah, I mean, they were, they cover some ground. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, so we've got November 30th, we've got Pennsylvania deer seasons open, Ohio deer seasons open. Kentucky just closed uh, on Sunday, so that's done. Got um, another month for Kansas. So I got two tags. I got a month in Kansas to mm -hmm. figure that out if, if I go back. And Ohio. And Ohio goes clear through the first week of February. Yeah, I got plenty of time there. Yep. Yeah, so, you know, it's kind of playing these late-season food sources. Who makes it through gun season? Uh, do any new bu bucks show up with the food sources um, coming up? And But one of the things that we've been talking about, obviously, a lot here is, obviously. you know, obviously, uh, is, you know, how are, in a state like, let's say, Ohio, how are things like corn piles really affecting these herds? Uh, you know, how's it affecting hunting hunting numbers? Well, we've got, yeah, we got a treat. So, so Mike Rex is our guest today, yep. and Mike is, I'm going to mess this up, but he's the chairman of the Ohio Wildlife Council. Council. Uh, it's a board of eight members. He's the chairman. Which, if you're in a different state like Pennsylvania or Michigan, if you have commissioners that are the head of the DNR or the Game Commission, Mike is the chairman of the commissioners. So Mike and these seven other members are the guys to hear, you know, field and ultimately vote on issues like baiting uh, in a in, yep. in season the state, limits, in the state of limits. Ohio. Yep. So we reached out to Mike initially, uh, or somebody put us in contact just because apparently we talk about baiting just that. in Ohio. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, David Colwell. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Mike's become somewhat of a friend here. We, we've, uh, we've we have really good discussions. Talked with a few Mike. times. He's, I think he realizes that we're not idiots. Yeah. Like for the, I mean, for the most part, anyways. But he's like, oh, okay. Somewhat. You, you know, these guys can actually have a conversation about <laughs> yeah. this. And so um, hopefully that's what we're going to do today is just kind of dig into um, just Mike's background, uh, you know, how that legislature is set up in Ohio how we feel like some of these issues that we've brought up are affecting the state and, and maybe how Mike perceives them. Well, yeah, get Mike's impact of like looking at it from the DNR level and really, you know, kind of being responsible for not only the wildlife, but the state of the hunters in Ohio. You know, that's kind of Mike's role here. And and keep in mind, Mike is a big buck killer. Dude killed a Absolutely. 220 plus inch or 218 inch net deer Giant. in Southern Ohio. Monster. Has killed, him and his sons have killed, what, 50 plus? Yeah. Big, buck. Ohio big bucks. Ohio big bucks. Like, I mean, it's not like who who's this guy, politician coming in. Like, Mike is by trade. He's a hunter. He's an outdoorsman. He cares about this. And so he's having to blend that passion with the political side of things, which, right. let's be honest, that that's what runs everything. Yeah. Well, and we're not going to pretend to know, like, the ins and outs of the, the, the politics behind this. Like, mm -hmm. we are coming at it from a standpoint of, like, I want to kill big bucks. Yeah, and I want hunter. a good, good situation for hunters, you know, and, and hopefully – um, Mike will shed some light on uh, the bigger picture that we all need to be privy to if we want changes to ever happen. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see. Yep, let's bring Mike on. Appreciate you coming on, Mike, uh, and and joining us here before you're getting into the into the tree stand. It's uh, Ohio gun season right now. You told me earlier, Mike, first time hunting in two years. Correct. What, oh, yeah, well, I, which I was surprised I to hear. Well, hang on, I wouldn't say first time, but I've only been in a stand a handful of times in the last two years. Mm -hmm. That's what happens when you kill a giant, huh? Yeah, well, that happens when you get to be 60 years old, too. So, but it, uh, I'm in the woods every day. I mean, I'm doing something related to hunting almost every day of the fall and spring, but I just haven't climbed into a stand. Interesting. So, so in your like last two years, then a lot of scouting and, and helping other people. I know your, your son just killed right. a, a big buck in Ohio, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So, yeah, two of my sons have actually killed big bucks in the last in the last couple of weeks. There you go. So a lot of scouting and, and I guess just enjoyment out of the scouting and finding them and, and that kind of thing as yeah. much. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I, I'm in love with the process of hunting, everything about it. But uh, as I've aged, I've lost, as, as my friend Eddie Salter told me once, he said, I've lost the blood in my eyes. So yeah. I, <laughs> I enjoy everything about hunting and I have no problem with, you know, the the finality of it and all that. But I just personally, uh, it's more the process that excites me than the actual hunting itself. Get it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you're not the first guy that we've talked to either that, uh, and, and we'll throw a picture up or, or people can Google your name probably and find the buck that you killed in 2005. Yeah. And uh, sure. I'll mess the number up. So what, what did that buck score, Mike? Uh, it netted two, 218 and six eights. <laughs> not typical. Wow. No, the, well, the t- go ahead. What was a typical? That's what I was going to ask. Uh, the typical frame. Now, of course, you, if you just forget about all the non-typical stuff and just net out the typical frame, yeah. it was right at 200 inches as eight points, which is really a huge Ape as an eight point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it is a really big frame. Jeez. But, but I will tell you this. The buck that you guys had on your podcast there a few days ago, that Alexander buck, Yeah. you could take my buck sit it inside of it. I mean, wow, that, that thing, really? Oh, my gosh. Oh, okay. Well, you guys saw it. I mean, I have to yeah. tell you. It, it was a giant. That thing was Unbelievable. Like, oh, my gosh. I, it's, I, yeah. it's one of the few times on this podcast I've been somewhat without words. I just kind of sat and <laughs> I even, because I watched the podcast back and I was like, I didn't say anything. I was just looking at it. I was just yeah. staring at it, mouth agape, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Huh. Yep. It's hard yeah, to believe that, that thing nice. just was walking around. Like yeah. just visualizing and, and looking at that antlers to think like that is a wild deer that was just walking around, you know, weeks ago. Um, just yeah. hard to comprehend that. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. I also think it's really amazing that no one's come forward with any kind of trail cam pictures or anybody other. Hard to, I told that young man when I, when I was uh, green taping it for him, I said, right now there's somebody that had to have all sharp objects taken away from them yep. because they, they, their life revolved around. I had to, especially in the area where that deer came from. It's mostly agricultural, yep. wide open. And so it's, it's almost impossible that that deer could have flown under the radar and nobody knew about it yeah well last night he actually sent us a video that somebody had sent him anonymously that. yeah and it looked like uh, oh was it anonymous yeah he has no idea who, somebody anonymously sent a video of that buck like a grainy video from a cell cam as that buck was chasing a doe through a field how do you even do that anonymously? Oh, wow. <laughs> that's weird. Well, he doesn't. His Facebook doesn't work, so maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe it wasn't anonymous, and he just doesn't know. But. It would have been hard horn in that video, right? I do think that they texted him. I think they got somebody got his phone number and just texted yeah. it to him. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. It was hard. It was uh, probably during the rut. It was trailing a doe. Oh, was it really? Yeah. So it had to be I've like got an Android. For, it looks like I bet it was like days before he killed it. Oh no way. Had to be. Wow. <laughs> right. Uh, well, well, Mike, you have to imagine somebody somewhere is really disappointed. Oh, no doubt. I can only imagine. Yeah. <laughs> well, and we talk about this all the time, Mike, and this might transition into kind of some of the stuff that you've been working on. But, you know, it, it's hard anymore to think about a deer of that caliber or any big deer, you know, say any deer over 150, 160 inches that is not being targeted by a hunter especially Absolutely. in states like Ohio and Pennsylvania yeah. and Illinois, like just the way that technology and hunting is advanced. Like they're just mm-hmm. known, like mm-hmm. there's not a mystery around them anymore. The last buck I killed two years ago, I killed in Washington County, right on the Athens, Washington yep. border on a property that belongs to my son. And <clears throat> excuse me, my son, we were taking infield photos of it at, on that property and he left his location services up. So it came up Cutler, Ohio, where the deer was killed. He put it on, a, I think, Instagram or some social media platform. And within a half an hour, we had two different people, one from Meigs County, which is a county south of Athens, which is another county yep. way, and another person from Washington County that both sent us trail camera photos of the damn deer. So, wow. Yeah. They're, or it's travels hard to fast. Imagine. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. they're just known. Imagine. Well, man. just the obsessive nature over, you know, deer of that, cl- you know, the guys that are targeting bucks like that is like, we're all so well connected. We're so, we have so many feelers out there, whether it's from cameras or, I mean, you told me how many yeah. cameras Mark Drury was running the other day. And yeah. Each of us are running whatever, 30. I don't 100, know. 100 non-cell cameras and 150 cell cams is what Mark Drury You got to wonder of like the top 10, per- you know, put yourself in the top 10% of guys like in whatever state and say, how many cameras are those guys running? How many, how many? What percentage of the deer of a certain age class are we getting on camera? A lot. Any more? A lot. You know, and it's kind of weird because, you know, Mike, go back to 2005. Like, you know, I I would assume you knew of that deer that you were hunting. Yes. And, Mm -hmm. but, but a deer of that caliber and any big deer still had a kind of a mystique about it because they, you know, cell cam technology and all this other stuff hadn't evolved to where like you just knew and targeted all of these deer. 
Um, most of the most of the cell cams twenty years ago, you had to take film to a to a uh, CBS <laughs> yeah. and have it developed. Yep, exactly. Right. So that I think becomes like this big question mark now, you know, and whether it's Ohio or somewhere else is like you know the technology that's allowing us to target these deer has completely changed hunting. And, and honestly, it's completely changed how I think a lot of people feel about big bucks anymore. Um, Cause they're not mysterious. It's like, well, you know, I've seen 50 trail camera pictures of this deer and now I finally killed them. Well, and here, Mike, I'm sorry, for sake of context is before we get too far into it here, can we, can you share with us? Um, I'll start and you can correct me. So you are the chairman of the board, which is the Ohio wildlife council. Uh, of mm-hmm. which there's eight members that make mm-hmm. decisions for the state of Ohio sure. on things like, uh, I, I don't know exactly what, maybe you can uh, expand from there. Um, so season dates, bag limits, that kind of stuff for, for fish and wildlife. So what I, I'm chairman of the Ohio Wildlife Council, and we, we either okay or no okay proposals that the division makes for changes to seasons or, or bag limits or any, any of that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So in relation to other states, Mike, would that be essentially you're a commissioner? Correct. Well, what would be like this? PA calls it the Game Commission. Correct. Uh, I think Michigan calls it the Game Commission. Ohio calls it the Wildlife Council. Got it's it. Basically the same thing. We're there are four Republicans, four Democrats, uh, appointed by the governor, and two of them have to derive their income from agriculture. So agriculture has to be involved. Got it. And how long have you been sitting in that position? Uh, I've been on the Wildlife Council for eight years, and I've been chairman for the last two years. Okay. How does the uh how does the like evolution of uh, those, how does that change? Like I assume every time there's a new governor, they all eight yeah. of them don't get swapped out, right? Well, not necessarily. I mean, there was, when I first got on the, the wildlife council, there was a gentleman, Charlie Franks, who'd been on through, I think six different governors. Wow. So if you're doing it, you know, if you're doing a pretty good job now, wildlife positions like the chief and the director, those change with administrations, those change with political parties. So if the Dems would win the, the, the governor's race, there's a real good chance that they'll be replaced by whoever, you know, Democratic people. And, excuse me, the Wildlife Council, because four Republicans, four Democrats, it, it tends to basically transcend governors, assuming that the person still wants to be on and is still, you know, doing a good job and attending the meetings and all that stuff. Got it. Yeah, for sure. Well, and so for transparency to our listeners, like, Mike, we've been pretty outspoken about uh, the, the baiting situation. Like, so our, my family farm is in Ohio, right? And so I've got a lot of firsthand experience just from our, our personal farm, our personal hunting. And so friends of friends were like, I, I don't know exactly how David got your phone number, but, but David Coldwell was like, oh, I just, I know Matt, I, I know Mike, I called him up and he's like, you guys should talk. And uh, that, that was how you and I got connected originally. And I was like, Grant, who am I? You know what I mean? I just, sure. I'll talk to somebody about the baiting thing. I'll, I'll share my experience. You know, I don't know where that will go, but that's kind of where we got connected. And then you were kind enough to, you know, say, Hey, let's, let's just do a podcast on it. So we're, we're appreciative of that. Sure. So where do you want to take it from there, Jeremy? Where do you, where do you want to start? Well, I, I think the interesting kind of piece that we've had this discussion around, um, and, and for context of this, just because I think from our experiences and where Mike's at in a position with the wildlife council, like, you know, let's keep it around the Ohio, um, sure. arms, arms reach here. But, you know, obviously I think a lot of the kind of talk of Ohio and, and I don't know, it's, we've even had this discussion, Jared, and I don't know if we see all the, you know, same page or eye to eye on it is, you know, it, Ohio has less hunters than it did 20 years ago. Would that be an accurate statement, Mike? Absolutely. Okay. And that's every state. Correct? Yep. Yeah. I mean, from what we've heard, most states or every state is in a decline. Um, in that same breath, it's- By about how much you told us, Mike, it was a hundred thousand hunters over what the yeah, last- Yeah, it's, it's a lot. Uh, and, and, a, and an even more disturbing trend is the average age of a deer hunter yep. in the mid eighties, or of, excuse me, of a hunter in the mid eighties was like 27, mid twenties. Today it's mid forties. Wow. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the hunting population is, is aging. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, single parent moms and dads don't have time or don't take their sons and daughters hunting. Now they're reliant on grandpa to take them hunting. Um, you know, there's both parents work. It's just basically the erosion of the, of the American family is a huge, huge play in that. No doubt. Which I think is a big, um, a big topic there, Mike, because I know when we were talking all in the the truck a few weeks ago when we were coming back from Illinois, you know, that was one of the first times that, that I've kind of heard that reasoning from a, a loss of hunting because, you know, you get things and I'm not saying that they aren't factors, but you know, access being a huge one, 
um, you know, probably the biggest, if, if anything, um, you know, coming up as this is why we're eroding hunter numbers, right? But the, you know, looking at the change of the American family over the last 20 plus years, um, I think is probably a, a giant reason for it that not a lot of people are talking about. Correct. You know, access is also huge. Though. I, I was telling somebody this morning, I went on Onyx Maps, I think it was a year or two ago, and I added up all the ground that I, I've been a resident of Athens County for 41 years. And it, during that time, over the last 41 years, I've had permission to hunt on over 30,000 private acres at one time. And not just deer hunter. I, some, I might have crow hunted. I might have duck hunted. I might have coyote hunted or whatever. But I, I, I could walk on that ground at one time and hunt on it that I cannot walk on today. Wow. Because it's been, because it's been bought or leased for recreational purposes. And so what, what's happening is the average blue collar guy is getting forced out of a lot of play. Hunting's becoming pay to play. Mm-hmm. And, and the average blue collar guy is getting forced out of a lot of areas. We also rank among the bottom of, of states for public hunting opportunities. And so that guy that, that used to be able to hunt that hundred acres or 500 acres or whatever that got bought or leased or sold or whatever. And now he's getting forced onto the Wayne national forest or wherever. And of course he's hunting with a bunch of other people. He doesn't like it. And he's, he's packing it in. And so it's, yep. it's a real disturbing trend. Yep. Mm-hmm. We saw recently, uh, in fact, Jeremy pointed out this morning, there was an article about, and I've actually participated briefly in, uh, sounds like state of Ohio has got some dollars pulled together to try to buy back access from private landowners. Is that the mm-hmm. uh, initiative that you're involved in? I'm not involved in it, but I, I'm familiar with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that that's been talked about. Yeah, so it was like, uh, just brief details on it. They're, um, it's a hunter per 50 acres is what the kind of cap is. And it's it's almost like an, uh, a reservation system. Yeah. You know, so if I go in the night before and, and there's a green dot and nobody has reserved it, I can reserve that spot. I then have right. sole p- permission to be one of the people for the 50 acres there. And there's quite a bit of ground. Um, you know, I can't remember what it, what it was. But, I mean, it. you know, talking about the access system, I mean, those are things. Um, because when you talk about dr- jamming all those people into, like, a Wayne National Forest, it then becomes a hunting experience type of thing, right? And what I don't know how to put into words, and, and Mike, you know, maybe you can do it better than I can, but, you know, when I was growing up in the 90s in hunting, uh, obviously, you know, per the numbers, there were more hunters there, but I still felt like the experience was fine. Like, I don't remember having a negative experience with more hunters in the woods. And maybe it was because we were more spread out, to your point, having 30,000 acres of, of access that you had permission on. But it's, it's hard to describe that to somebody now where, you know, they say, well, there's less hunters, and yet my experience is, is kind of worse. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, that, that again, but it all depends on access, on what ground you have access to, right? So if you, for example, within five miles of my house, there, there are two private landowners that own, both own over 2,000 acres of mostly wooded, some agriculture, but mostly wooded terrain. Mm-hmm. So 30 years ago, there were maybe 100, 150 people that could hunt those properties. Today, there are 10. So those 10 people are, you know what I'm saying? They've got, right. you know, they've got some pretty quality hunting experience. But uh, unfortunately, the people that used to hunt it that can't hunt it anymore either aren't or they're hunting somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And so I assume there was a tipping point there, right? Because, I mean, the, the number of hunters have decreased and obviously access yeah. has decreased. So there, there's an offset there to where it maybe didn't impact people as much. But then at some point, the lack of access overtook the lack of or the decreasing number of hunters. What is the reason? Well, I mean, between the three of us here, like, what would we attribute the loss of access to? Well, I can tell you a big one was, for example, leasing. Yeah, Leasing sure. has been prevalent in the South and the Southwest for years. Paper companies in Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Louisiana, they've been leasing their ground since the 60s, mm-hmm. in the 70s, for sure in Texas. Because Ohio is so populous, we've got almost 12 million people from Cincinnati to Cleveland and all parts in between. Our state's broken up into small chunks, 50 acres, 100 acres, 150. You know, a big farm in Ohio is five, 600 acres, right? Mm-hmm. A big farm in Texas is, is 250,000 acres right. or whatever, a ranch. And so pay to play was slow to catch on here. It didn't catch on in the Midwest until just maybe the last 15, 20 years. But boy, did it catch on. And, and also, uh, especially in the Appalachian, in the unglaciated hills of eastern and southeastern Ohio, it's kind of the final frontier. So you urban sprawl. You've got all these people in these metro areas that are coming to rural America. And they're used to paying $100,000 for a house lot in Upper Arlington. 
You know, I mean, they can buy a farm, you know, for a hundred acres for that down or where, or something like that, a lot less. So mm-hmm. they're buying up a lot of the rural ground. They're leasing up a lot of the rural ground. And then a lot of the quote unquote rural people or whoever, the people that live there that have been hunting it for years are getting forced out. Yeah, we've seen, I've seen that in, so I have a place in, um, in East central Kentucky, basically, but same kind of thing, like, a you know, cheaper land values and stuff in the last three to four years, the number of people from California, Montana, all of these States where, you know, they couldn't buy an acre for a million dollars. They bring $500,000 out and they get 500 acres. Well, well, I understand literally what's doing it, you know, between buying and leasing or uh, revoking of permission for liability reasons or whatever, you know, that's literally what's causing the loss of access. But what, What's motivating it? Like, you know, and I'll start, I would say certainly the industry has, you know, some blame to share in that. It's like we, we put a high uh, a commodity value on a, a big antler deer. So that's certainly one thing. Guys are like, I want to kill a big antler deer. So and I'll by any means necessary, I'll do that. Mm-hmm. Is that the is that the sole thing that's driving these markets or, right. you know, are there so, other things? So let me give you a few other anecdotal uh, scenarios. So there's a campground below my house, Stroud's Run State Park in Athens County. So 30 years ago, there are 80 slips in that campground. So one of my fun things to do on Monday Monday afternoon of the opening week of gun season was to drive through that campground and look and see what was hanging in the trees. Because those guys, a lot of times that's how I found out if a deer was still alive or not by <laughs> driving through that campground. So, <clears throat> excuse me, back then all 80 slips in that campground were taken by out of the area hunters, they weren't non-residents. They were from Western Ohio, Northwestern Ohio, agriculture areas of Ohio that didn't have the deer that we have in Southeastern Ohio. And they were deer hunters. They came to hunt deer. They brown it's down. They, you know, some of them wanted to kill a big buck and, they, and all of them wanted to kill a big buck. But if they saw a doe or a button buck or whatever, they were shooting at it. Conversely, this past Sunday evening, I drove through that campground and the, the state has actually reduced it some to 60 slips because they put some new bathrooms in. But out of 60 slips, seven of them were taken Whoa. all by non-resident gun hunters. And But if you would have gone through the same campground three weeks ago during the peak of the rut, 25, 30 slips were taken by non-resident trophy hunters. They were here for our quality. So, so those deer hunters that used to come to the Appalachian Hills excuse me, to deer hunt are now staying home because they either have deer at home or they're not hunting anymore or whatever. And they have been replaced by non-resident hunters that are coming here for our quality. Mm -hmm. And and a fear that I have is, you know, how long can we sustain that until we become Mississippi and, you know, Tennessee and whatever. I, 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 maybe it's indefinite, but, but it's certainly got to be some kind of a concern because when so many people are, are coming here specifically for quality. I'll give you another example. So I've got two groups of guys that come and hunt with me every year. Two of them come from Louisiana and they have, a, they have their own hunt camp in Mississippi. These are college buddies. Well, one guy worked with me, the other guy's a college buddy. Then I have a, another group of two guys that come from New Hampshire and I worked with them off and on for the last 30 years. So the New Hampshire guys, when they come here, they always kill their limited does because they come from a state where they'll sit on a stand for two weeks and won't see a deer. I mean, they, these guys are, now they try to kill big bucks while they're here too, but they see a doe, they shoot it mm-hmm. because they want to take venison home. On the flip side, the guys from Louisiana who hunt in Louisiana, Mississippi, where they have lots of deer, but not the quality that we have. They've been hunting with me for 30 years and not killed one doe. Mm-hmm. They come here specifically for our quality. And that's, especially the guys, that are the, the hunters that come here from the Southern states and the Southeast, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, those guys are almost, they're driving by lots of deer to get here. They're trying to kill a big deer. A lot of the people coming from the Northeast, Vermont, New Hampshire, those areas, they're coming here to deer hunt because they don't have deer. Where right. They're at. Uh, where, where would you say, I mean, I don't think there's nowhere in Ohio that's like really lacking in deer numbers right now, is there? Or not, I mean, I, I'm, some of the agriculture areas, are, you know, you, yeah. this, 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 some of the areas where they have small woodlots and huge expanses of, of agriculture, you can, you know, they can knock them down pretty hard in those areas. But yeah. I will say that the eastern third of Ohio, the the unglaciated hills, is doing really well. Yeah. So that that need has essentially been met. Like, if people want to kill deer, they can kill deer kind of anywhere they're at in Ohio. Um, yes, absolutely. I, I'd agree with you. You know, uh, you know, I come from across the state border, even though my family lives in Ohio currently, and most of my friends out there are, are residents. Uh, most of the, the guys that I know, residents or non-residents, are focusing on, on quality for the most part. Um, yeah. 
Why do you say, Mike, uh, that the long-term quality is a concern of yours? Well, because we're high grading. You know, we're, we're targeting the best. So in nature, right, the coyotes and the wolves and the bears and the mountain lions, they're, they, they're not trophy yeah. hunters. Right? They're just trying to catch some. That, that, mm-hmm. that's, they, and I, I don't know if this is true or not, but I've heard and read over the years that the, they claim that the, the deer densities were far lower when the pilgrims set foot on Plymouth Rock, but the quality was better because the strong survive, right? right? The biggest and the best. So what are we targeting? We're, we're targeting the best. Mm-hmm. And so if you, I mean, so for example, why do, I mean, obviously there's a different strain of whitetail and there's some other reasons into it, but some of these Southern states where they hunt deer through the rut with rifles and they have 60 day rifle seasons like Alabama and places like that, they, that's why they don't have the quality. One, I mean, the Ohio Division of Wildlife or Department of Natural Resources Division of Wildlife has done a lot of good things over the years for Ohio's deer population. And maybe the best has been one buck a year regardless. Mm -hmm. And we don't hunt deer through the rut with guns. If you look at Indiana, Indiana used to be a two buck state. And Indiana geographically is just like Ohio. Northern Indiana, pool table flat. That's where the glacier came. Great agriculture. Southern Indiana, rolling hills, just like Southern Ohio. But they were nowhere near us in Boone and Crockett entries for the longest time because they could kill two bucks and they hunted through the rut with guns. Mm-hmm. Indiana went to one buck, their number of Boone and Crockett entries phew, through the roof. Now, if they would just get rid of gun season on November 15th, they could, there's no reason Indiana won't be just like Ohio. Hmm. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Hoyt Archery. Oh, dude, it's almost fall. You and I are both going to be in a tree stand with brand new Hoyt bows. We're going to be shooting the RX-7 carbon bow this year. I know Hoyt's also got the Venoms out, both equally smooth shooting, quiet bows. Heck yeah, man. We got a convert on our hands this year. We got a lifelong crossbow guy with a vertical bow in his hands for maybe the first time ever, a good friend of mine. And uh, we've got them all decked out with uh, the inline accessories uh, from the QAD integrated ultra rest uh, to the quiver. And also he's got the SL sidebar mount with a couple of stabilizers from Hoyt as well. So that's going to be a sick shooting bow. Yeah. And Hoyt's been cool enough that anyone listening to this can save 20% on any of the soft good apparels online using the code HUNTER, H-U-N-T-R, no E. Uh, and if you want to look at the latest lineup of Hoyt bows, check out your local Hoyt dealer. Get serious, get Hoyt. Interesting. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and it's funny because we're rehashing. We, we had an hour-long phone conversation, you know, kind of about this before, so we're going to re- re-dig into some of it. But, like, I I definitely agree. Like, the, the long-term le- long je- or the, you know, the longevity of us being able to kill quality animals in Ohio concerns, concerns me as well. Like, so I see it on a micro level, like with our farm and, you know, the, you know, a couple thousand acres that I have, uh, knowledge on or permission to and stuff. And it's like, you probably see it on a macro level, but like the, the things that I attribute it to would be things that allow us to, uh, effectively and specifically target an age class of bucks. So like, if we know that whatever you tell me the percentage, let's say it's more than 50% of people hunting in Ohio are looking for, uh, a high quality antler, you know, a, a, a big old, you know, big score and mature buck. And the tools that we have to do that, you know, in today's day and age would be cell cams, corn piles, straight wall cartridge rifles, box blinds, you know, run down the list. Like it, it's gone to a point where it's like, dude, if you can't kill a three-year-old buck with a gun in Ohio, like you're doing something wrong, you know, and I, w- would you agree that those are some, you know, that's kind of like, to me, today's day and age of like a gun season during the rut or a two, a two buck limit. It's like, we have the same thing, but it, it more specifically targets those three and four year old bucks. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and we've, be, you, no doubt we've become a much more efficient predator. I mean, and, and also, so I'll, I'll take it back. I'm, I started deer hunting 1978. So a lot of hunters like myself, you go through a progression in the beginning, man, you just want to get one. Then you got one. Okay. So now I want to get a buck. Okay, I got one. Now I want to get a big buck. I got one. You know, that kind of stuff. And you just want to keep, you know, a lot of people want to keep getting better, progressing, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, hunters as a group, the, the information that's out there now with podcasts, with television shows, magazines, whatever, is so much more widespread than it was 30, 40 years ago. I mean, sure. the, the, the knowledge. And then on top of that, the weapons. You, you, you touched on, uh, you know, crossbows. How about uh, the muzzleloaders today? They're a muzzle loader today is basically a single shot, high powered rifle. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. I mean, anything but primitive. I mean, and anything but primitive. Sure. And so, you know, the guns, the shotguns shoot really well now the, that we're allowed to use straight wall rifle cartridges. And so we become a much more efficient predator. I'll draw you another parallel. So I'm a real avid turkey hunter. 
So 35 years ago, I, I was very fortunate. I started turkey hunting early in my career with some of the best turkey hunters in the world, like Eddie Salter. And I mean, some of the, at that, uh, Matt Moret, I mean, guys that were, you know, way, way ahead of their time and mm -hmm. really, really had their shit together. So I was fortunate that, man, I learned a lot of stuff real early that the average person didn't know. Well, today I have no, what I would call intellectual capital on turkey hunting that everybody else doesn't have. Right. You know what I mean, calls are so much better today than they used to be. I, I've been calling turkeys for almost 40 years. I listen to guys that just started last year that can call circles around me. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's just, it's, it, it, it's changed so much. And again, the information out there on how to do it. And then back to your point, corn piles have changed the game. And, 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 and I mean, baiting has been legal in Ohio, I think forever. I mean, I don't know yeah. that it was ever, it was I ever have crossbows, illegal. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, crossbows go back. Yeah. At least 40 years. Yep. And so, the, but what's changed is, you know, these Raven crossbows now can shoot, you know, hundred yards and, yeah, and, the technology, know, like said, the information, lines. and the demand for them. Those are the three things. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to ask yeah. about the corn pile side, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we just said mm -hmm. it. Like, corn piles in, in Ohio have been legal for forever. For, yeah. yeah. As long as we can remember. But mm -hmm. what makes yeah. it seem like there's so much more prevalent in the last, I don't know, five, ten years even? You know, I don't know. Obviously, the more people do it and they talk about it, and, and then people feel like they have to do it. Like, you were, I think you were talking about yeah. it. Uh, maybe an I, feel, or I do. I feel like I have yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the people that I know, well, I, I shouldn't say this, but there's, there's, there's several seems to be groups of people that seem to be opposed to the baiting. One would be the purists, the ones that think we're getting away from hunting and the tradition of hunting and, and actually hunting, you know, it's mm -hmm. more killing and right. versus hunting. You know, those are two different sports, right? Right. And so th there's those people. Then the people that are screaming the loudest to me anyway, are, Large landowners, like I've got one friend in particular that owns 500 acres of the prettiest property you've ever seen. This guy's the undisputed king of food plots. He puts in over 100 acres of food plots. He's like a commercial farmer just for food plots. And, and it's just money down the drain, bucket. right? What's that? And it's just money down the drain, right? Because all his neighbors shoot all his box off corn piles. Exactly. All yep. the neighbors around him. Are <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that is, acres, that is where we're at. That's the, I'm experiencing exactly. the same thing. Mm -hmm. They bait the deer off his property and they shoot him and... and He's just sick about it. And it's mm -hmm. and it, because, but flip side, I tell him, Hey, not everybody can afford a million dollars worth of farming equipment to go out and do all that stuff. But the, the flip side of all that is, and, and I think we had this in this discussion earlier. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a generation of hunters today that I think if you took baiting away from them, they probably couldn't hunt their way out of the truck. Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, I, I don't mean that, you know, they, it's just true. It's well, the only way they know how well, to, Mike, let's, how to see, the let's see if we can agree on a statistic. I mean, I, I would just throw the number out there. I think it's 90% of the deer in Ohio get killed on corn piles. 90%. I don't know about that. It's a lot. I would say it's a lot. That, yeah, that number, sure. that's, uh, that's coming from my taxidermist. So he and I were, we, you know, yeah. we, we, do you know, Trav, Trav's yeah. taxidermist, but anyways, we're trying to figure it out because I, I like to ask him like he sees a lot more deer than I do right I'm like and it's mm -hmm. his inter his observations are interesting because I'm like um the, the corn thing is one I'm like how, how many deer do you think I killed over corn he's like boy it's it's got to be 80 or 90 percent I'm like okay interesting uh mm -hmm. what's the quality like and he'll he'll say it's getting better he's like I think you know guys are killing bigger bucks every year mm -hmm. Um, interesting, which I well, find he, interesting. Him being a taxidermist, though, he might that might be anecdotal because it could be. he's people are just bringing the best of the best to him, right? It sure. could be, could be. Yeah, I just look My at the, look, yeah, go ahead. No, I just looked at it. We, we were talking about this on the side, you know. I think it, it, you said it about the high grading side, Mike. I think it just mm -hmm. keeps coming back to this targeting ability, right? Like, if, if we take mm -hmm. it away, like, let's just say even before cell cameras, right? Don't even go back past trail cameras, just before cell cameras. The fact was is that there was a good chance that if somebody went out uh, this past Monday for the opening day of gun season, they had even if they sat over a corn pile, right? They had no idea what deer they were actually targeting to shoot, right? The, uh, big buck comes in, they shoot it. Could be a two-year-old, could be a five-year-old. They didn't know. With the advent of, of cell cameras, they know which deer are coming to that corn pile. So in their mind, they've already pre-selected, like, here's the three bucks that I'm going to shoot. In, in most cases, you know, regardless of the age, because they just don't care, right? It's, it's big antler deer for most hunters. So it could be the best quality three-year-old that they shoot when in reality, if you would have taken away that ability to know which deer were there, they yeah. may have shot the first two-year-old that showed up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're saying information from trail cameras without the correct diagnosis to say, 
I should shoot an older age class buck, regardless of his thing, is affecting. It's a it's a blind harvest versus a known harvest yeah, type right. of thing. Right. And so anytime you know the crop that you're actually going to go harvest, it's it's completely biased to what you're going to select uh, versus the random sampling of, well, yep, that deer is good enough today. I'm going to shoot him. Yeah, I completely agree. Her Mike, I want to let you finish on, uh, you were starting to say about there's a, a generation of hunters that, you know, couldn't hunt their way out of a paper bag without corn piles. We'd agree that there's a high percentage of deer killed off of corn piles, regardless of what that is. Yeah, uh, oh, obviously there's that. lots of them, sure. Yeah. Sorry, you were going so, down. But, uh, real quick, to hit, I, I'd like to, to, to address that point just for a second, go. what you're talking about. My, my sons, and I have three sons, uh, and we're all avid hunters. We have not killed a deer in 20 years that we didn't know about that we didn't have some type of reconnaissance on and the last not to say that if a giant would have stumbled by from somewhere else we wouldn't have shot it mm -hmm. or try, you know what i'm saying sure but we have not in 20 years shot a deer that we didn't have some kind of history with for sure yeah yeah and i mean i would assume with that mike that you know it, there's a lot of people like that including myself like i you know i rarely am surprised in the woods anymore when i see a deer you know in fact kansas was probably the first time this year because we weren't allowed to run cameras on public land it was illegal mm -hmm. so i turn around and there's a 180 inch deer behind me and it's like whoa where did this thing come from where historically i you know i just know what to expect um mm -hmm. and i wonder with you know and and so this is kind of taking away the guys who are looking at killing mature deer the guys who are just simply out there wanting to kill a big buck, a, a good buck, whatever it is, I, I think that's where you see this increased high grading because they know if they pass this 110-inch 2-year-old 8-point, there's a 140-inch 3-year-old 10 behind it or 140-inch 3-year-old you know, 12 behind it. Whatever it is, that they, they're able to kind of have insight into the future of, well, I can't pass this because another better deer exists in their mind. Yeah. No, that's, a, that's a very good point. I never thought of that, but yeah, that, that makes sense. And I wonder when you start to see, because Kansas is another example of where we've seen the quality in Kansas drop like a rock. Um, and this year was the first year on public land that they banned cameras. I would assume that you start to see some of these better quality deer slip through because they're not being able to be targeted as much. Mm. Yeah, it makes sense. Trail cameras in, in the hills where I live, if you took trail cameras away from me and almost everybody else I know that, that hunts, our success, our quality success would, would drop like a rock. Absolutely. Just would, because we can't, I can't glass fields. I mean, people I know that hunt ag areas, central Ohio, northern Ohio, northeastern Ohio, we just don't have it. So trail cameras are your eyes in the woods. They just are. Would that, um, just opinionated, Mike, would that make your hunting experience better or worse? So I struggle to, to go sit in a place I struggle, I, I put, I, I play a, I guess a mental game with myself and I'll come up with a reason to get down if I'm not confident that there's something in the area that I'm interested in. Agree. So that's, that's, you know, I guess, I don't know, that's just me personally, but I would bet that a lot of people feel the same way. Yeah. I would say that I'm in that same boat. You know, I, I don't, um, I would say that if I don't have a deer to hunt on a particular farm, that I'm not going to just go out there and hunt for the hell of it. Right. It, yeah. be, it, if there's not something that I, I know that I would shoot. Well, you, you can make the same argument, you know, like Mike's saying, there's a whole generation of guys that can't hunt without corn piles. The sure. exact same is true for trail cameras. Absolutely. You know, it's like, yeah, boy, oh, sure. we hunt almost mm -hmm. exclusively off of our trail cameras, you know, and in some cases, a combination of all these tools. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you're, just, you're talking about removing them. Yeah. And I'm just looking at the, the fact of like from a from a hunting experience side, as well as potentially a biological side of getting deer through that aren't being targeted, like could trail cameras disappearing be a good thing? Sure. Sure. Wow. Well, Mike, let, let's keep walking. Yeah, let's, good keep, point. let's keep, keep walking your point out earlier. You're talking about uh, a concern for the continued quality in Ohio, uh, based on sounds like us high grading mm -hmm. by targeting, um, you know, big, big mm -hmm. antler deer basically. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. What, what can we do? I mean, what, what are the potential remedies for that? I mean, how do you, how do you fix that? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I know the one thing we don't want, though, no matter what, is we don't want to lose more hunters. Sure. Because when we lose more hunters, we lose votes. When we lose votes, then we lose our position with the, with the legislature. And at the end of the day, those are the guys, you know what I'm saying, that we have to, and the gals, that we have to be most concerned about. So... We don't, and, and also we want to be strong and unified against the people that would like to take our 
our our uh, heritage away from us. And so we don't want to lose hunters. That that's big, in my opinion. They they talk about their three R's: retention, uh, recruitment, and reactivation. Mm -hmm. Those are all really important for the future of the sport. So as far as the high grading goes, that's that's so tricky. Wildlife resource management is extremely complicated. I, I can give you a couple uh, real world examples. I have a PhD in the in the wildlife resource management school of hard knocks. I've made every mistake you can make. So I, at one time, I had control over an 800 acre block behind my house, complete control over it for many years, so it's 30 years. So I took this very simplistic view that, boy, if I can just keep a bunch of people out from, you know, killing everything, shooting everything, I'm going to have a Boone and Crockett behind every bush. The exact opposite happened. The area around me, very heavily hunted, state forest, national forest, uh, public or private ground that got hunted real hard. <clears throat> Excuse me. The does behind my house that weren't being shot were displacing their male offspring to keep them from breeding their sisters and their aunts and their cousins. So all the year and a half old bucks were getting booted out by their mothers. The bucks that should have been replacing those weren't coming in because they were dead because they were being killed on all the property around me. And so over a period of time, my habitat started to erode. The population started to explode and my quality started to implode. It got worse instead of better. And so what I learned is, to have a healthy, quote unquote, ecosystem or a healthy deer population, whatever you want to call it, you've got to take deer out. Another example, Meigs County, where you say you have you own property yep. in Meigs County, is that correct? Yep. Okay, so Meigs County has had two of the worst EHD outbreaks in Ohio and known in Ohio history. The worst prior to this past year was in 2007 in Meigs County. It was so bad. I actually went down with some DNR guys to try to census to get a handle how many dead deer there were. In some of those townships, you couldn't open the door of your truck, the smell of death. It was unbelievable how wow. many deer died. So speed it up five years forward to 2012. Meigs County went from just a run-of-the-mill average southeast Ohio county from a quality standpoint, quality standpoint to being number one in the state of Ohio for Buckeye Big Buck entries that year, 2012. And nothing changed. There weren't more scores. There, same guy, been there forever. They went from being an average county to being the top county in Ohio five years after the worst EHD outbreak the state had ever seen. So what happened? Nature came in, chlorinated the gene pool, got rid of the big, strong, weak, everything in between, started from scratch. Fewer deer on the landscape, better nutrition, Right. Better. I don't say better genetics, but you got rid of a lot of. So here's another problem with the, the quote unquote high grading that we're doing. Five year old seven points are getting a pass. Right. And they're doing yeah. a lot of breeding. So a lot, you know, a lot of a lot of, of, of scrub bucks are living to old age that years ago would have been shot. They're not being shot because in a one buck a year state, you don't want to burn it on something Not you don't want to. But a lot of people don't sure. want to burn it on you know, a lesser buck. Right. Even if it's seven years old, they're not interested in it because it's whatever. And so. EHD, Mother Nature came in and just leveled the playing field. So, hmm. all right, we're going to start from scratch. Five years later, tops in Ohio. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. It's, it's interesting. Mo most of me agrees with that. Like, I've seen the same thing. Like, I would say, like, yeah, you need to, yeah. when you control the herd, like, uh, yeah. you know, food, cover, and water are the three resources that they need. And if the, the population yeah. is overrunning the resource, then, you know, that's obviously not good quality of antler size is going to suffer. The, the deer herd in general is going to suffer, mm -hmm. but isn't that kind of, it's kind of at odds with, you know, a recent conversation that we've been having, uh, in, in Illinois is where it's been most prevalent as we're seeing like, uh, statewide from, is it the early two thousands mm -hmm. guys shared a statistic with us that the total deer population by all indicators, like, uh, harvest reports, deer vehicle collisions mm -hmm. is down like 40 mm -hmm. or 50%. Um, hmm. and right along with it are the quality, uh, metrics, you know what I mean? So B Boone and Crockett animals that are reported it's, mm -hmm. so we have half the deer that we had in Illinois from 20 years ago and mm -hmm. less than half of the quality metric is getting reported. And we had less hunters, but we were killing more mm -hmm. does. Yeah. That was the mm -hmm. change is that they had, had basically implemented more doe harvest out of there. So, and, and my mm -hmm. feeling is that that probably depends on the availability of the resource. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that Illinois has, well, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say it's possible that Illinois has more ability to hold, has a higher herring, uh, carrying, carrying capacity of deer, whereas mm -hmm. a wooded part of Ohio, you know, may not. It, it's there. You're literally reaching a threshold of deer that it can uh, sustainably hold. And that could be, but I would, whoever the person was who told you that, I would ask them as far as censuses go, how many deer are on the landscape? Mm-hmm. 
we don't know how many people live in the state of California. Yeah. How are they going to tell you how many? What they can tell you is just the deer herd expanding or contracting. And there's metrics that they use in Ohio. We use the buck harvest, and then there's a percentage of the does that are killed. And it's it's not an act. They used to give a number. They estimate 700,000. And Mike Tonkovich, the deer project leader for Ohio, is a good friend of mine, a really, really, really bright guy. And he used to cringe when he had, he'd, he'd have to give a number. He didn't want to, but he'd have to. He'd just pull something sure, out of Sure, yeah, because how do you people know? People would get exactly. mad about it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So there might be fewer deer in Illinois than there were 20 years ago or whatever. I, I'm not saying that's not true, mm -hmm. but as far as the percentage of what it is, that, that's real subjective because they just don't know. I mean, there's, there's just no way of knowing. Well, like you're I saying, tell you that, oh, go ahead. It, oh, like you're saying, it's based on, you know, the only metrics that we can look at. I mean, I think deer vehicle yeah. collisions are a good one. I harvest think harvest reports, reports are. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and let me give you one other example. And this is anecdotal also, but I used to own a, a pretty big lake, a 28 acre lake. And prior to me owning it, it was like public property. A guy that owned it lived out of the area, and everybody and her brother fished it. And it was a tremendous fishery. At one time in the 80s, the second and third largest bass in the history of Ohio came out of this lake. It's only 28 acres. And I remember thinking, oh, man, all I got to do is keep everybody out of here, and I'm going to have a five-pound bass underneath every log. And the exact opposite happened. I kept everybody out of there. And I, that's when I learned in wildlife, you can have quality or you can have quantity, but you can't have both. Mm -hmm. You can't have lots. You, you, you know what I'm saying? You're either going to have big deer or you're going to have lots of deer. You're not going to have lots of big deer. I don't care. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You just can't. And unless you, in, 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 the, in the deer world, unless you can manage tens or thousands and thousands of acres, the dang things travel. I mean, you just can't keep them from, and sure. they also don't tolerate each other. Sure. Yeah. They just don't. So, uh, yeah. And I think, anyway. the, I think the limiting, you know, the thing that sets the, the glass ceiling on that would be the habitat. Well, I was going to ask yeah. then, yeah. you know, from a, from a landscape level, right. From a state level, what, what mm -hmm. would Ohio DNR school be? Is it quantity and opportunity or is it quality? Well, I think that, you know, the, the, the DNR, Division of Wildlife, they're charged with appeasing everybody. Yep. So they want the, the soccer moms that are worried about deer run out in front. Of, they want to appease them. They're worried about the anti, you know, who don't want any deer killed for any reason. So they're trying to appease, appease everybody. Um, that being said, there, I mean, I, the, the goal, the ultimate goal is to have a sustainable population for all Ohioans to enjoy. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that's a very broad brush, but that's the ultimate goal. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, when we look at like people fleeing, you know, fleeing the South to come up to Ohio to hunt because of the quality, it's kind of an indirect part of the overall goal for Ohio's deer well, herd. Mike, you shared a stat with oh, me that yeah. blew my mind. Did, did you say it was 57% of the license bill is footed by non-residents? Yeah, it's not. Oh. This, this was a couple of years ago, but the, statistically it was 11% uh, of the hunters in Ohio are non-residents and they pay 57% of the bill, meaning that. 57% of the, of the money brought in from the sale of wow. license tags came from non -res. It's really high. And that's, yeah. And, and we don't, and, and, and they also pump lots of money into our local economy. Absolutely. Sure. Lots of money. And that's yeah. influenced somewhat by residents in Ohio don't have to buy a license, right? Uh, well, no landowners, resident landowners. landowners correct. Uh, yeah. Sorry. That's what yeah. I meant. Do they have yeah. to get a permit? I don't think they have to do anything. Yeah, I mean, right? uh, uh, no, a landowner does not have to, yeah. but a, a, a resident to hunt, yeah, but it's a lot less expensive. Yeah, it's cheap. Uh, Non-resident license and deer tags, like 300 bucks or something like that, 200 and some dollars, mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, 50 or 40 or 50 for a, for a resident. For a resident. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, obviously, with that said, like, there there is an importance of keeping up the quality overall for the Ohio oh, deer, sure. because that's what's oh, yeah. bringing in yeah, the non resident like That's what keeps those people coming. Absolutely. It's yeah. also all, probably in turn affected a lot of the, the land prices in the state. I mean, so, oh, you know, oh, yeah. for better or for worse, I mean, a lot of people will say, yeah. well, I can't afford a 40 anymore. At the same time, yeah. if you owned a 40 or your dad or your grandpa owned a yeah. 40, guess what? It's worth a lot of money nowadays. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, rural land prices are spiking. It's, 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 and that's not going to get any better. The, you guys, this is totally off topic, but they're, they're building that Intel facility just east of Columbus. Yep. And I saw I saw a statistic. They estimate in the next ten years that a million people are moving into Central Ohio because of that. Not just Intel, but all the ancillary stuff going on around it. Wow. So those people are gonna they got to live somewhere. They're gonna have fun somewhere. So wow. I think the, the 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 final frontier, which is eastern and southeastern Ohio, is about to be. Uh, yeah, you know, it's about to be. Uh, 
a very expensive proposition. I've seen, um, I don't know if that's in like Licking County and stuff, that land prices are like thirteen, fourteen thousand 14000 an acre for some of those pieces oh, of ground. Oh, no, way, way more than that. Is it? The ground around didn't tell selling for a quarter million an acre. <sighs> Yeah, oh I have I have a personal friend that owns a that that owns a farm or his family owns a farm in Perry County, 20 miles from the Intel facility, and they the farm was purchased in 1960. It was a I believe it was a working dairy for seventy five dollars an acre, and they just turned down thirty six thousand dollars an acre. Oh my gosh! In Perry County. <laughs> wow, that's hard Still, to believe, isn't in, it? In Hock in Hocking County in the Hocking Hills hillside ground selling for ten to fifteen thousand dollars an acre. In Hocking wow. County right now. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Boy, I'm really conflicted about how I feel about it. It's like, it's, it's amazing and it's cool. I'm like, I'm happy for those landowners that it's like they could receive that amount of money, but it also just disgusts me that. Well, it goes back uh, to the, the conversation we've had is like, where's the cap? You know, because yeah. you think about it from a recreational standpoint. Well, and who's left out? You know what I mean? Dude, yeah. The, That's the, exactly right. The hunting utility can only go so far. Like, you know, if it's me versus Intel to buy a piece of property that could be good to hunt on, like, who's going to win? Yeah. Right? right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. My good friend Tom Vorsek, who's on the Wildlife Council with me, he told me we were talking about Intel. And he said, if you think you can stop progress, talk to the American Indian. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. That's wild. Well, in the short term, if we can, I want to circle back to, you know, we, we talked about kind of the, the two main issues when it relates to, to baiting. So like the, the anecdotal, anecdotal thing is, uh, you know, the concern, you know, fr from our end that, you know, the reason we bring it up is like, you know, we worry that it targets a specific age class of, of animal, you know, three and four, three and four year old bucks, you know, these, these great potential bucks get killed. And on the flip mm -hmm. side, we're saying th the major concern of addressing that or, or nixing it or whatever is that, you know, is the loss of hunters. Um, and I'm, I'm understanding that correctly. Correct. Yeah. I mean, that's my concern is that if you, if you were to take baiting away, you would also take, you would also lose a bunch of hunters. Yeah. So, I mean, Mike, what do we do, you know, t to address the fact that like we're losing hunters anyways? Yeah, sure. Well, I can tell you what the division of wildlife in Ohio is doing is They've started a, a, a PR campaign to try to talk about the perils of baiting, some of the downsides to it, some of the, uh, I guess for lack of a better word, some of the options, you know, not necessarily options, but just, just addressing it from a, from a public relations standpoint and try to explain to people that, hey, there, you know, there's a lot of downside to this too, and, so, and this is what it is. So I don't think there's any plans anytime soon to, to outlaw it, but on the flip, other than in areas where CWD pops up. But... Uh, I, I think they're mostly just going to use a PR campaign, which I think is smart to try to educate people and, and try to get them to at least some people anyway, to try to approach hunting in a different perspective. Like, it, like what? I mean, what are the perils of baiting? Oh, well, obviously there's all kinds of perils. So there's a lot of unintended consequences. There's no question we are artificially propping up the raccoon population in Ohio, right? Absolutely. So if anybody that's ever run a trail camera or a corn pile knows that we are feeding the shit out of all kinds of animals. Mm -hmm. And some of them are unintended consequences. If you're a turkey hunter, you don't want to see that, yeah, right? You don't want to see 12, 12 raccoons. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Um, you know, a lot of people, I was talking to somebody about this the other day. So if you, let's say you have a cabin in the hills and it's just a weekend getaway and you're only there every couple of weeks. So what a lot of people tend to do is well i won't be here for two weeks so i'm going to take 500 pounds of corn and dump it in the backyard here <laughs> dump it wherever and they think wow that's going to be good for them well no it's not i mean you they, they get a condition called acetosis where they they can actually die from it it's very 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 especially a deer in a woodland environment that's eating nothing but woody brows most of the year if he over if he overdoes it on carbohydrates like that with corn it can kill him you can yeah. kill him with kindness and so it, it's just not you know necessarily there's just i guess just a lot of downside to it Boy, I, I mean, I, mean, I want to believe in that PR program, but I just, I don't, I don't see that doing anything. I neither. No, I don't, listen, I don't think it's, I don't think it's good. I don't think it is the answer, but I think it's something. Sure. It's something that, that at least can, you know, if you talk about debating and, and, and all the aspects of it, at least it'll get some people to think about it. I don't yeah. think it'll get the masses. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we, I mean, we talk a lot about, it. I mean, does, you know, people that have just come across our podcast might say, that's all those guys talk about is, is baiting, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, real quick, another downside. Mm -hmm. So if you're using bait solely for the reason, the purposes of killing a deer, right? Or getting, getting a deer within your sights, right? Most hunters that do that bait right up until the time they kill a deer and then they stop. Mm -hmm. So you get these animals dependent on coming into this and you artificially prop up the population by feeding them, feeding no them, feeding them. And then you kill your deer in December. And then which months are coming up? 
January, February, March. When are the months that they would need it the most? Yeah. Right. So if you're actually going to help them get through, but do people do it to help the deer or they do it to kill the deer? I mean, I agree, but like if one guy stops baiting, there's 10 other corn piles they can go to. Yeah, but not in January, February, right? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's true. Is, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Which even if there were, I mean, a corn pile in January and February is not going to carry that deer's nutritional value through the winter. Oh, yeah. no, 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 no. But my point is, is that you're artificially, yeah. we're artificially propping them up and then we're pulling the rug out for them. And then one time of the year, they could actually use it. Well, I think what's right. interesting too is, you know, we talk about the hunter side for the votes, but obviously, you know, mm -hmm. not necessarily the antis, but the non-hunting public is who carries the most votes, right? And the most Absolutely. weight. Absolutely. Yep. I would assume mm -hmm. that if you would pull most non-hunting people and said, hey, how do you feel about baiting and hunting? They would think it's cheating. Yes or no. I mean, it depends. I, I would agree with you. Some people would, but if, if you go fishing, you take your kid fishing, right? Yep. And you're going to take a bobber and a hook and a split shot, and you're going to lance this night sure. crawler with it. What are you doing? Yeah, you're baiting. You're baiting. Aren't you baiting? But yeah, so that, those are, Mike, those are two right? totally different resources, though. Like, there's, they're literally our fish in a barrel. It's like you literally can just keep pulling them out versus, I mean, a mature whitetail buck. I mean, that that's a different animal altogether. Okay, so let's, let, let's talk about that for just a second. If killing a mature whitetail buck was as easy as throwing a bag of corn out in your backyard or wherever, everybody would kill mature bucks, right? So it's not that easy. I'll give you another. I'll give you another scenario. Are you guys familiar with David Morris? Do you know yeah. David Morris? Yep. Okay. So he's he's a friend of mine. He's probably the most knowledgeable whitetail guy I've ever met. I mean, this guy's an encyclopedia. I just talked to him like two days ago. Yeah. Yeah. So you know what I'm talking about. He, he used to own Fort Perry and yep. Burnt Pine. And yep. So I, I picked him up at the airport once about four or five years ago. And we got into a conversation about trail cameras, and we started talking about big bucks and when you see big bucks and he asked me some questions and all of a sudden lights just started going off in my head he said mike he said, when do you get most of your big buck trail camp here i said well it's at night and he said well why do you think that is and he, well i think that's because big bucks travel mostly at night he said yeah that's true he said but when at night and i said well usually it's in the middle of the night and he said right so why is that and i said well i don't know and he said well i'll tell you why he said think about it if it was just the cover of darkness and mature bucks are the most dominant animals out there why wouldn't they be the first deer there? He said, where are you putting your cameras? You're putting them in high traffic areas. You're putting them in over apple trees, corn oil feeders, food plots, pinch points, scrapes, whatever. You're putting them in areas where you most likely would encounter a deer, right? I mm -hmm. said, yep. And he said, well, let me tell you what's really going on. He said, when a buck gets to be five and a half and for sure six and a half years old, they become antisocial. And what he, what he means by that is, and he's, he learned this through radio collaring him for years. They don't like crowds. They don't like crowds of any kind. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not saying big bucks aren't killed over bait. Sure they are. But I'm saying that the first deer to a bait pile or a bait, whatever, is rarely the buck that you're interested in. Sure. You get does and yearlings around you for any period of time, and you're not in one of those shooting houses that's airtight or whatever that, you're probably going to get busted. And if mature bucks really don't like crowds, if they really don't like crowds, then the reason they're coming to these areas at one, two, three, or four o'clock in the morning is that's when the crowds are gone. Sure. That's when all the other deer have cleared out, man, when he said that, because uh. I started thinking to myself about how over the years, the big bucks that we've killed and where we killed them. It's almost always on fringe areas, perimeter areas, areas around the food plot, areas around that, you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. usually never right there. And so when he started saying that, I, I thought, man, that makes complete sense. So then when you think about it, you have an entire industry Food plot seed supplements, of which he owns Tecamati, yep. which that's what that's what they do, right? Yep. Is built up around this. We're trying to create this Valhalla for deer. We're trying to make this where we're gonna create, we're gonna draw lots of deer. But if your objective is the biggest and the best, the old ones, you're really probably hurting yourself more than you know, you should be hunting the perimeter of that, not where they are, mm -hmm. not where the not where the masses are. Yeah. So anyway, I, I, de down off my soapbox. I definitely would agree with that. Um I think that I think the thing that trumps that reclusive nature of a mature whitetail buck is the rut and well let, let, let me no, no, so let me give you some more anecdotal. Well, this really is an anecdotal this is statistical okay. so i'm the secretary of the buckeye big buck club so over the last 20 years i was president now now i'm secretary so the last 20 years i've processed every state record score sheet that's that's been killed in the state by officially scored okay mm -hmm. i can tell you that matter factly the number of club so to make the buckeye big buck club is 140 typical 160 non-typical 
the vast majority of our club qualifiers in that 140 to 150 range typical and 160 class non-typicals are killed the first 10 days to two weeks in November. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of the Boone and Crockett's, the top 170 typicals, 195 non-typicals, are killed the second half of November after the rut has slowed down. So statistically, the deer that are most likely to make that mistake are the three and four year olds and five year olds. The, the five, six, seven, and eight year olds, I don't think they. I think they do very little well, breeding. I yeah. think I think they're more about they're more about survival than procreation. Mm, sure. Yeah, I, I can see that point too. But I mean, think about what that lines up with, though. I mean, that's. Are you talking purely archery box or both? No, no, I'm talking about deer. Period. Yeah. That includes guns and everything. There are far more archery entries now in the state record book than there are guns. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I don't know. I guess in my. Uh, what I would point to where I'm like, man, a, a mature buck is most vulnerable to be killed over a corn pile. To me, it's that, uh, it, it's the opener of youth season, uh, youth gun season. It's like that third weekend of November when, and I don't think those bucks are even coming to the corn because of the corn. They're coming there because some of those last few does are dragging them in there. That could um, be. That's been that mo be. most of my <laughs> personal experiences with big bucks on corn piles, whether I saw them in person or, uh, you know, or from cameras has been that third and fourth. It's, it's the gun season, frankly. It's, it's like, boy, every time it comes to this time of year, I'm like, it, it feels like a perfect storm to me of like when a buck is most vulnerable to show himself on a corn pile in daylight directly overlaps with the gun seasons that we have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that could be the later, the better. I would, I would argue then even later in the season, December, January, you know, into the last last week of January, no first week of February, they'd be most vulnerable. And it becomes more sure. about the climate, you know, the, the weather at that point. Yeah, correct. Cold weather pushes them out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, just generally speaking, like I agree. I agree with everything you're saying about the, the, the reclusive nature and stuff. I think that's all true. But to the guys that say you can't kill a big buck off of corn pile, I think that's complete, no. complete bullshit. All, all you have to do is see the state of Texas, right? Right. I mean, right. I mean, literally, that's that's that that's how. I mean, they they were the masturbators. They were the first guys to really, excuse me, make that popular. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Mm -hmm. Huh. Yeah. It's it's a tough one. I definitely see the issue, man. It's like as as much as I want baiting gone in Ohio, I I hear your concerns about uh, losing hunters mm -hmm. along with that, boy, it seems like we've got too many hunters to begin with. Like, <laughs> do, I mean, doesn't it like the whole first yeah, part of our yeah. conversation is like, we lost yeah, our 30,000 yeah. acres of access because of yeah. number of hunters. And now here we yeah. are desperately trying to hang on to hunters that we have with a thing yeah. that nobody wants. Yeah. And I'm like, no, I, I, I don't know it, what to it, do it, with it. Yeah, that. I agree. It's tough. <laughs> Yeah, it's a chicken. Know, I, it's a chicken and egg situation, right? I mean, it, yeah. it, it's like you. If you want more hunters, you've got to have more places to put the hunters. Mm -hmm. What? Absolutely. Yes, yes. I think it's a contradiction. I, I think that the continued allowance of corn piles and crossbows and cell cams, frankly, I'll throw that in the boat. There is, we're propping up a a pseudo demographic of hunters. Like you could almost say that that's not hunting. Those aren't hunters, and it's declining anyways. And so mm -hmm. I, I think Jeremy and I's fear is that we eventually reach a point where the experience becomes so unenjoyable because I've lost all the access that I did have. The only thing that's less left is I have to dump a corn pile and I have to shoot it with a gun over, you know, with a, with a cell cam or whatever, that those people are just like, eh, I'm, well, I mean, that's I'm done with that. We've had these theoretical talks, right? And this was after Mike's conversation where it's like, okay, I think we're, because of the political side of it, right, which is part of wildlife management, we can't lose hunter numbers, sure. right? If if removing baiting in the state of Ohio loses a significant portion of hunter numbers, that it's not an option. However, we're losing hunter numbers anyways, so I don't know that that's valid. Well, we would lose them faster. Sure. If they woke up this tomorrow and said, "Okay, we're done, hunt, we're done baiting." Yep. We would lose them faster. Yeah. Sure. So again, the options then are: how do you keep hunter numbers? Yep. How do you enhance the hunting experience? Yep. Um, and how do you, in, in part of this discussion, stop high grading? That's why I, you know, I propose like, what if you ban trail cameras during the hunting season? Mm -hmm. Sure. You, well, you yeah, know, we're, who, we're, who's going to quit hunting because they can't use a trail camera? Right. Some people will, undoubtedly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Undoubtedly. Is it as many as with corn paws? I don't know. Probably not. That's what we're doing here. We're trying to circle the thing that's like, why are we losing hunters to begin with? 
you know, in, in per Mike's political, uh, you know, position, he, he you know, it, that would be a problem. It sounds yes. like, you know, we, we don't necessarily have the full capacity of that, but we, we want a certain number of hunters. We don't want to lose any more, but we also want to stop the high grading and stop the poor experience for the people that are still here. Mm-hmm. And so we're, tr- we're trying to like identify. Well, and, wh- and in some points there, uh, in, in a weird way, and I know people cringe about it, is I want to make hunting a little bit harder. Right? Absolutely. And, and it's because the reason that the three of us love hunting is because we had to grind it out, right? They, there wasn't cell cams and corn piles and heated blinds and, like, I had a sterno can and, uh, sure. you know. We, fa- <laughs> we failed for years. Yeah, yeah. and so it took that, us years to kill a buck. That grind made it. So that's where I say, okay, maybe you do lose some hunters from a trail camera, but then you bring back a lot more of the element of surprise of what's out there. Um, and you also put more randomization into the targeting of bucks because of that. I don't know. You solve some of the issues without losing hunters. And again, maybe because this is the one that I don't know, right? It's all speculation, but there are plenty of guys I know in Ohio who are either running thousands of acres of leases and or outfitting thousands of acres. You cannot effectively watch and manage those properties if you don't have trail cameras. I think you would see some access come back because I don't think people would spend money to lease property that they can't observe and know what's happening there to either hunt and or put hunters at. Yeah. Hmm. So real quick, fellas, do, do, do you guys, either of you have uh, kids? I do. Okay. Uh, how old are they? Seven and 11. Okay. Do they hunt? Yes. Okay. So I have, I have three kids, 29, 30, and 31. And mm-hmm. all three of them love to hunt. As a matter of fact, my, my middle son, if we had a weasel season, he'd be out there chasing them around. I mean, he mm-hmm. just ate up with it, right? Yep. So when they were growing up, I had this dilemma. And the dilemma was, boy, I want my kids to be interested in the outdoors. And I want them to like hunting. I want them to like fishing. And I want it to be fun, but I don't want it to be easy. Because if it's too easy, then they just assume stay home, play a video game I'm, or whatever. I'm right? in the position right now, Mike. There, there you go. That's a, that is a tough one because you want them, you want them to have a quality experience. So yeah. I have a, a good friend of mine, one of my best friends whose father passed away, but he, he was a good friend of mine also. And when my boys were little, I asked, I asked my buddy's dad, I said, how did you do it? How did you do it? And he said, well, every time it was possible to invite my son to go with me, I did. If it, sometimes it wasn't possible. And if I knew the weather was going to be awful, we were going to have an awful experience. I just went. But if it was possible to take him and I thought there was a chance we were going to have a good time, I did. And he always did. And that's what I did with my kids. I always, I made it, uh, I tried to make it fun, but I also tried to make it difficult because if you don't do, if you don't do both of those, they'll lose interest. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. They'll lose interest. Yep. Yeah. And I've so got to your point about hunting. Yeah. You're talking about the general population. You make it harder. And, and in theory, you might gain some people if it's, if it's harder. Mm-hmm. flip side you make it too hard you'll lose people absolutely which is why i think if you you know and it it maybe is the unfortunate thing here if you take away baiting you're going to make it dramatically harder for a lot of people yeah especially the guys who have five or ten acres that would effectively not be worth anything so real quick let's talk about why we're talking about things that we see as being unethical or what not necessarily unethical but too easy or whatever yep so you guys are deer you know all about thermal currents and wind direction and, and, and I I've gotten to, I've come full circle on like scent elimination and all that. I don't do anything anymore when I go hunting. I just play the wind. Yeah. Because if you're if you're breathing, you're giving off human scent. Sure. And I don't care if you're immersed in a vat of scent killer. If a deer's downwind of you and you're breathing, they know you're there. Yeah. We're with and, you. And, Agree. You know, they they just do. And so anyway, some of these new blinds that are on the market today that are scent tight, airtight, airproof. I mean, I, I watch videos, guys got deer in 360 degrees all around them for hours. Oh, man, what an advantage over, <laughs> what, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I killed my first yeah. buck in, in 1978. I was sitting on a tree branch, you know? <laughs> yeah, So absolutely. What, what an advantage. What an advantage. Yeah, and I mean, you see it a lot. I mean, a, a ton of people use those blinds and stuff. I mean, yeah. I, I do think that understanding wind currents and thermals from a, from a buck movement, especially mature bucks. I mean, if you're out there just to kill yeah. a deer, you know, whatever, but I think from hunting mature bucks and especially a specific deer, you know, understanding yeah. those wind currents and thermals and things like that as relation to where you're set up and bedding and directions. I mean, that that's critical. 
What do you, what do you think would happen, Mike, if just hypothetically we said next year there's no baiting in Ohio? Like mm-hmm. literally, what do you think would happen? Like, so next year, I mean, I think first thing the-, I, the first thing I think would happen is the, the division of wildlife would benefit dramatically from all the tickets that would be written yeah. for people that would continue to bait anyway. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you go up to Michigan, baiting's illegal in Michigan right now too. Yeah. And, uh, because of CWD and almost every gas station, every corner has got sugar beets and apples yeah. and everything. Right, right here, there. right so, down the road, dude, in Pennsylvania, it's illegal here. They sell, you know, deer corn, right? A tractor supply. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so I think that would be, that would be one thing. And the second thing would be, I believe we would lose hunters. I really do. I think there'd be some people say, well, you know what? I only got 12 acres out here. I'm just going to watch football, yep. you know, or whatever. I'm going to do something else. How many do you I, think I really, we'd lose, Mike? Just. Oh man, I know that's a hard question. I just think, I think it'd be substantial. Yeah. I think it would be a lot of people. Cause again, I, I believe there's a bunch of people out there that can't hunt without it. Now I think on a plus side, I think food plot, uh, planting and, habitat improvement projects those things would skyrocket yeah because you'd have to now right so you'd have to but not have to but if you want an edge you'd Mm -hmm. have to Mm -hmm. and so i think you'd see a lot more of that so i think uh you know tractor dealers and seed dealers and fertilizer and all that stuff they'd be real happy to see it yeah and the quality of the habitat itself would be greatly improved very very well could yeah yeah, i would would assume herd dynamics would improve greatly then uh you know yeah i mean in theory possibly I guess you would have fewer, I believe you would have fewer trophy bucks killed. Fewer mature bucks would be killed. More of them would survive. Yeah. yeah. But to to a point. In the short term, for could, sure. Could we keep the population in check to keep that well, herd quality better? We've, we talked about so that let's earlier. Get, let, let, let's go back to Illinois. You know, so Illinois doesn't allow baiting, right? Yeah, oh, correct. And, and you just said their their guy says they're down 40% or 50% or whatever correct. Yep. over the last 20 years. So they're they're able to keep them in check in Illinois. Well, I think that so, was that was initiated by a major EHD die-off. I don't know if that attributes yeah, no, for that, all of that's it. That's probably true. That's probably true too. So I don't know for sure. I mean, mm-hmm. c- certainly those seem to be the two things. You know, when we say, you know, hey, from a quality standpoint and from a habitat standpoint, you know, for, from all these reasons, it seems like it would make sense to get rid of baiting. But we don't want to lose hunters, and we need to control the herd mm-hmm. still. That's our greatest responsibility. Which uh, the second one seems easier. I mean, I think. I think you can create incentive or the ability for, for guys to control herd. I think that's doable. I mean, and it's not quotas. I'll tell you that. Aren't, aren't we already barely meeting half of the quota? From the division's perspective, a bigger issue is access. Yeah. As access shrinks for the average hunter, the division loses their lever. You know what I'm saying? When, when the division wildlife has been able to control the deer population mm. by, by expanding seasons, contracting seasons, by expanding the tags, you know, the number of tags issued bag, you know, bag limits, all that stuff. As hunters lose access, then they lose control over that. Yes. You can issue all the permits in the world if the hunters yeah. can't get at them. hundred percent. Right. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Muddy and Stealth Cam Trail Cameras. Cell cams, cell cams, cell cams. What an evolution the industry has seen. And we've experienced personally over the past five, ten, you know, whatever cameras were invented, right? It's like, man, it's totally changed the way that we inventory deer, pattern deer, and ultimately the decisions that we make when we're going out to hunt. They're a serious piece of the puzzle. And, and uh, you know, that information is invaluable for us. We trust the Muddy and Stealth Cams, you know, together to be able to, to collect any of that information. Yeah, I mean, as an admitted trail cam addict, you know, I've definitely been guilty of of under hunting places or relying too heavily on that information that's come in that said it's an invaluable tool to the overall management plan and strategy that i have for my own properties or even hunting public land it doesn't yeah. matter we have a finite amount of time in going out and hunting so when you and i are after a particular class or quality of deer usually a mature buck we can't waste time hunting an area where that deer doesn't exist. And those cell cams provide that information that allow us to spend the time in the area with the highest chance to accomplish our goals. I say it all the time, man. You can't kill them if they're not there. That's it. So right now, any of our listeners can use uh, code HUNTER20 to get 20% off either muddy or stealth cameras. Uh, we're certainly going to be taking advantage of that, and we hope you guys do too. Yep, check out Stealth Cam and Muddy. So. Seems like that's the root is like access. Well, yeah, I, I agree. And it's like, what, what is, how, how can you reduce, you know, land ownership is, is always going to be, it's going to be there and it's going to be, you know, moderately influenced. I think the big issue is how do you reduce leasing in Ohio? Cause leasing is probably the yeah. one thing that's exploded across the state of Ohio. Yeah. That's really driven access out. In, in a capitalist society, I don't think you well, can. Well, that's what, it, yeah, exactly. You know, you can't blame the landowner who owns a 50-acre cattle pasture to lease it for $5,000 a year. 
for hunting. Like, well, you, I, I'll tell you this. I, yeah. I, I don't know if how many people would fall into this boat here, but like, so Mike, I've got access to, um, you know, at least 1500 acres that I control almost exclusively. And there's, we have close family members that hunt it and stuff and we don't let anybody else on it. Right. Cause we're boy, like we, we invest a lot of money into it and we're doing everything we can to try to shoot four and five year old bucks. Um, happens very rarely. Frankly, we don't have very many of them. Hence a, a lot of my beef, you know, with, you know, things that I feel are taken. It's, I'm in the same situation as your, your good buddy who's got the 500 acre deal and all his neighbors shoot all his deer. Mm-hmm. All our neighbors shoot all our deer yeah. too at, at three years old, basically. Right. And right. that bums me out, not just because I don't have mature bucks to hunt, uh, mm-hmm. just generally speaking, I, I do from time to time. Um, Mm-hmm. It's not a pity party for me. It bums me out for that reason, but it also bums me out because there are a lot of people that I would love to expose to that property and to the deer that it could offer. Um, and I don't, I don't have that opportunity to invite them because those deer aren't there. They're getting killed by all of the neighboring properties, you know, well before their time, in my opinion, you know, it's, it's let me, go, ahead. go ahead. No, you go. I was just going to lay something else out for you to, to consider. So why, and for lack of a better word, why are we allowed to hunt? So we're allowed to hunt. If you think about this for a second, so if you if you if you take the population of residents in Ohio, you've got this segment on one side that the antis they hate hunting, right? Mm-hmm. And and they're very focused. Also, they have one goal in mind: stop, stop. hunting, yeah. right? Stop trapping, stop hunting. They don't like fishing, but you you understand the mentality, right? Yep. So then they, then you have us, but we are a very fractured and fragmented family. The Crossbow people don't like the strong straight wall rifle cartridge people who are mad at the North season duck zone guys who are the squirrel hunters and the rabbit hunters are messing me up and the da da da. We're a very dysfunctional family. We, we, we struggle to see eye to eye on things where the people who are opposed to us are very unified. They have one goal, stop it. Mm -hmm. So then in between them and us, which is the majority that you talked about a little bit ago, they're the people that don't care. That's the, that's the soccer mom that just doesn't want to see her azalea bushes get eaten. She doesn't want the deer to jump out in front of her van. You know where those are the, those are the majority of the people, right? Those people don't care about quality and the things that we're talking about. Of course. Right. The majority. Sure. So what we're talking about really is an issue amongst us, amongst hunters. Absolutely. Not necessarily an issue amongst everybody. Mm-hmm. Sure. Does that make sense? It does. And the anti-hunters, they don't care about trophy. They just don't want to, they don't want you shooting Bambi. They don't want you shooting Godzilla. They don't want any, anything in between. Do you follow me? Yeah. yeah. What, what's your point? Well, my, my, my point is, is you're talking about why you want to see baiting, not because my neighbors and this and, 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 and will the quality get better and will we retain more hunters and all that stuff. And in reality, mm. Uh, we the majority need to doesn't care. In, in, yeah. in, in my opinion, sure, I would we agree. just need to get on one page and say, hey, you know, we got to embrace the crossbows. We got to embrace the long hunters and the and the and the black powder guys and the flintlock guys and the every. We all have to come together and realize that we're not the enemy. The enemy is not the enemy, but we're not the adversary. The adversary is the people on the other end that just want to stop it all. Sure. Mm-hmm. If that does that make ha, sense to you? It does. Has that ever happened, Mike? I, I know you, you shared no, with us. No, not real well, France. You know, you look at Europe. I mean, it's almost impossible. If you want to go hunting, it's almost impossible to own a gun in Europe. But if you want to go hunting in Europe, it's it's I mean, you got it. Only the elite hunt in Europe. Yeah. The common yeah. blue collar guy in, in Paris doesn't go doesn't go stag hunting. Well, but like in America, I know you shared an example even in Ohio about the the bobcat thing. You're like, you know, hey, we tried to get yeah. a season for them years ago, and the anti shut it down because yeah. they're cute and cuddly. Yeah, well, it wasn't necessarily the anti's, but it was just it was rushed through, and we, so we had to table it. Correct. Have they ever affected a deer season in the United States that you're aware of? Boy, now nah, I can't speak to that. I don't know, but I can tell you that they are affecting seasons in general. If you look at Colorado, you look at some of the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, uh, some of their game commissions are being seeded with anti people that, 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 that are anti hunters. Wow. And of course so, that, Hey, that, that's not impossible. That could be us 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years from now. Right? <laughs> sure. I mean, though I've tried to be open to that. I just, it, it's one thing to sit at this table and be like, yep, that seems like a, a valid concern. Like, yeah, you, know, you can look at Colorado and stuff. They shut us down. But like, also when I'm out hunting, when I'm driving around during the hunting season, it's like everybody hunts. Like, everywhere you go it's like a fr- do you not see that no i do but i don't see it any more than i used to you know what i'm saying i guess i, I see a lot more bow hunters than i ever have crossbow I see hunters. fewer gun hunters 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Archers, we'll call them archers. Yeah, you can call them archers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> guys that are shooting uh, a projectile with a broadhead on the end of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But they don't all pull it back in the presence of game. But yeah. yeah, I got you. <laughs> You know so, what I'm saying? Yeah, no, it's like I drive around. I'm like, holy shit! Like, there's guys everywhere. Like, well, how, I mean, are, that goes how are we possibly the, at risk real, of? Real quick, real mm-hmm. quick. Something else that you have to be cognizant of. So I've made this same mistake, and 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 you're. I'm not picking on you, but this is go for it. This is this is very this is very common. Mm-hmm. What we see with our eyes is anecdotal. Sure. It's what you see with your eyes. But what's going on in Van Wert County or Mercer County or Dark County or Green County? Isn't necessarily what's no happening in Columbiana County no where, doubt. where you are. Well, I, that brings up another point. I mean, may, maybe it is uh, regional. You know, maybe it is like well, on a county we, by county basis. We just basis. talked about it on, um, well, I don't know. Were you up at the farm on Monday on opening day? Yeah. Did you hear a bunch of shots? Yeah. Uh, and I was in Meigs County and I heard 12, 13 shots. There you go. Like, and I would assume that there was a pile of guys out because that's just what I think about when I think about opening day of guns. Well, they're definitely different, uh, you know, regions. Like yeah. I, I'm in that eastern, I'm Columbia and Carroll County is, is where I'm at, Mike, and, and you're down in Meg. So they're definitely yeah. different. And I'm wide open to the possibility that like the issue that I'm experiencing is is where I'm at. However, just like Illinois, however, I mean, Illinois, the guy's telling us he never hears a shot. Yeah. We were in a war, yeah, even in small pockets <laughs> and stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. However, uh, we talked to a lot of people on this podcast who talked to a lot of people in their areas. And I mean, the the. You know, what's the word? The uh, the theme, basically what we get, it's the same thing. Well, you know, everywhere you go, it's like, yeah, the, the parking uh, lots are full. S- y- yes, I just. Per, and again, we're taken with a grain of salt. During the archery We, we have to assume that hunter numbers are dropping because that's what we see across all the states out there, right? Yet, to our point, it seems like every damn property in America is being hunted. It's the, like the greatest t- contradiction that we well, can't no, figure no, no. out. I think it comes back to this whole... Le- it's not every property is not hunted recreationally because it's owned. This lease thing has changed the game in much of the Midwest and Northeast. Sure. You know, when it to Mike's point, when these paper companies, I, w- I lived in Mississippi, when Mississippi Paper Company Warehouser leased a piece of land, it's 30,000 acres to 100 guys. And they had a hunt club on 30,000 acres. That was leasing. Leasing on 30 acres, 40 acres in Ohio, that, that concept was applied to lands that I don't think can sustain leasing. Mm-hmm. In yeah. my opinion. Well, I totally and- agree with you. That's why it was slow to catch on up here. You're exactly right, because we don't have those expanses. You don't have those expanses. Like have How do you well, put six guys on 30 and acres? You mentioned it earlier. One thing that we think has kind of like expedited that is as tech, as crossbow technology has increased and in states where it hasn't been a part of the archery season in the past is, you know, these guys may not have been willing to spend $3,000 for a lease that I can hunt two or three days, but if I can hunt it for two or three months, yeah, sure. Absolutely. You know, I'll get a couple guys together 100%. and bring that all together. That's, that's a good point. I think that's a big piece of it is, is when it was like I was hunting gun season, I'm like a spend three thousand dollars on this that's crazy but when i have two to three months to come down and hunt and do things absolutely becomes yeah. worth it they're, they're two different issues and i think when we we talk through i mean they overlap a lot but the more we talk about it is like the access issue where you know i, I believe crossbows are a major contributor to a major sure. one you know when it comes to um when it comes to leasing when it comes to you know the justification of 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 you know occupying land for the purpose of hunting it. It's only worth it if I can hunt it for an extent. Well, in Ohio, that is what makes it so puzzling because yep. they've been crossbows for 40 years. It's not necessarily the same issue that I have with baiting, which frankly I think is tied more to the gun seasons and you know the targeting of specific age class of bucks. I think the two you know, the, the two on top of each other, on top of, you know, Mike, everything we've talked about, the dissolution of the, the American family, the, you know, the, the older age demographic, all of these things that are happening, you know, the loss of hunters. It's Would just you like, say it's worse in the last year than it has been five years ago? What? Just, just everything you're experiencing. Is it getting worse or was five years ago, it's still just as bad? Myself personally, our access is less and our quality of bucks is less. I blame sale cameras. I think the room, they're certainly I think a culprit. I think the and I'm I'm a massive user of them, but I think the ability to remotely monitor all these places to put me there when I'm not there has absolutely eroded all opportunity of access and in hunting. Undoubtedly, one of the culprits. There's no doubt, one of the culprits. I, 
Not the biggest, no, in no, my opinion. Well, but. but I think in tandem with the other ones, it makes the others more efficient. It makes no crossbows more do. efficient. It makes corn piles more efficient. It makes bow hunting more efficient, period. Like, no doubt. I think all of those things are enhanced by that. Would there still be impacts if you removed cell cams? Absolutely. But I think that you would see things change. I think you would see access open back up because people can't remotely monitor a place three hours away. Case in point, my Ohio farm, I'd still hunt it, but I wouldn't have the ability to remotely monitor three hours away to say, yep, I'm going to go down next week because those bucks are really starting to move. I'd have to go purely on hunting gut, which, frankly, to Mike's point, most people can't do out of a paper bag. <laughs> I know so, we're rambling. So guys, we're passionate me, about this, quick, Mike. Post, <laughs> go, go for ahead. it. No, you go. <laughs> I was just going to pose a question to you guys. Please. So, how much of this discussion, though, has changed based on your evolution as a hunter? So if this were 15 years ago, or yep. 20 years ago, would you still have these same issues or is it because you guys have you as as hunters your expectations for what you're looking for you're looking for top end bucks right mm -hmm. has changed when you 20 years ago you probably weren't like this right <laughs> yeah you can go so first how, uh, can i go first yeah go first I, sure it's hard to answer because undoubtedly our our standards have changed we we've evolved as hunters um, i'm 30 years old so 20 years ago i'd have been 10 years old Jeremy's 39, yeah. so he's slightly ahead. All right, of me. we'll call it 15 years ago then. Go ahead. Yeah. It, it's hard to answer because while that has changed and our standards have certainly evolved, uh, mm -hmm. the technology I feel has evolved even faster. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so it's not all technology, but in conjunction with long standing, whatever principles or situations like bait, like crossbows in a state like Ohio have had the biggest effect on it, I, I think. So, yes, my standards are greater than they were 10, 15 years ago. Uh, however, it's it's also, it, it's a completely different environment. So, so mine... Because of the technology and the, the industry pressure. So, mine have changed recently because of kids. And so, I've killed big deer, not Mike Rex big deer or, or CJ Anderson big deer, but I've killed big deer. Uh, 15 years ago, I hunted because it was fun and it was the experience with my family. That's what I love to do. Mm -hmm. 10, seven, 10 years ago, I was trying to kill a giant bucks. That was the goal in life. Now with my kids back, I wish I had the experience thing back. And I, I feel challenged with that, that my kids, to your point, Mike, my kids know which bucks we're going to hunt in Ohio next weekend. Cause we have cell cameras and they see them and they kind of know what the experience is. Um, Back 15 years ago when I sat in a tree stand and I scouted and I had big rubs and stuff, but I, I didn't know. Could have been a just a junky five-year-old. Could have been a 200-inch deer. You had no idea. That element of surprise elevated my experience of hunting beyond words probably. To today, I think that knowing what's out there has eroded the experience even more than corn piles or crossbows could ever do, in my opinion. On the flip side, though, it could be challenging because now instead of just arbitrarily going out and hunting, you're trying to hunt this one specific deer. 100%. Getting within bow range of them has gotten really hard. Yeah, absolutely. And so. that's what I do. I'm a, I'm a, I'm normally a one buck guy. When I go to hunt a property, it's for one deer. I'm not out there to right. kill a mature buck. I'm there to kill right. a single deer. It, it's an interesting right. question. Yeah. It's funny how our age differences are maybe playing to this a little bit too. I can barely remember a time where we hunted without trail cameras. Yeah. But I remember when trail cameras, when we first started using them, mm -hmm. that's what hooked me. Yeah. Cause it was like Christmas to check. And see I was what's like, there. Holy cow. Like, look at, we, you know, so there's definitely an argument. I know how you're coming about mm -hmm. this. There's definitely an argument to be made that it's, there's, it, it's cool. It's part sure. of the fun element. Sure. Right. Like we obviously love looking at, trail camera pictures My it's phone's awesome been blowing up as we're it's awesome here. to see what out there but but it's definitely like you're saying potentially a double-edged sword because it takes away from the experience in some capacity the, the element of surprise and hunting was always something even if you knew like let's say you sat a bean field or whatever you, you knew the deer was there you in pennsylvania you could spotlight like even if that happened there still was an element of surprise of like you put the pieces together and ended up in a spot and now you're laying eyes on them in a hunting situation um, I'm not saying that it's completely gone, but it for sure has dwindled quickly with not 
maybe not just trail cameras, cellular cameras has, has eroded that fast, very fast. Mm -hmm. The advent of trail cameras, to Mike's point, I remember developing film. I remember my first digital trail camera and I pulled a card and there were 250 pictures on it. I'm like, what is this? This is, you know, mind blowing. But I was, I was a step behind, right? That, that data was from the last two and a half weeks. It was great to see, but it didn't put me in, I thought that much of a better position to, to capitalize on it in the next week ahead. When I am sitting here right now, like if sure. a buck showed up on my camera right now, I could be home in five minutes and in a tree stand. That that has completely changed everything about how we've hunted and monitored a system. Have have you guys can you attribute specific bucks that you got specifically because of a wireless trail camera? Where you if yep. it weren't for a wireless trail camera, you'd never encounter that deer. Most of them. Most okay. likely. Okay, so I, I've, I've killed three that, when I say were a direct result, one, I was in a stand, this was in 2011, I was in a stand, and ping, uh, this was back when the smart scouters were the first wireless yep. trail cameras, and I got a ping on my phone, and I look, and a farm 40 minutes away from me, a buck out at a distance that I couldn't see real well, but it looked big out at a distance, passed in front of my uh, wireless trail camera, I got down out of the tree I was in, packed up my stuff, waited an hour, got in the stand in an area where that deer was, and killed that deer an hour later. Now, without a wireless trail camera, I never get out of the tree and never move. The next year, some October the 8th, I remember because of my son's birthday, I got up in the morning for a morning hunt, and the flat, I had, I had a, a wireless trail camera on a flat leading to my stand, and the buck that I was targeting passed by in the dark, right as I was get, just getting ready to go to the stand, I didn't go. Had I not seen that picture, I would have spooked him. Yeah. And I, and I wound up killing him that evening. So I wouldn't have killed him that evening if I'd have went in there and ran him off in the dark. And then, the following year, late season, it's a it's the only late season big buck I ever killed was in January. I was actually putting my clothes on to go to work, <laughs> and I got a picture. And I called my boss and said, I'm going to be late today. <laughs> and I, and I, I got in a vehicle and I went out and I got in a, in a logical spot to encounter that deer. And I killed him that morning. Three, three years in a row, three dead bucks, three tro trophy bucks that if it weren't for a wireless trail camera, I never encounter. Can I just ask you for fun, Mike? How many of those uh, were on corn piles? Uh, none. None of the cameras were on corn piles. But that was... Uh, let me think. Let me think. The first deer was killed. Yeah, no, none of them. None they weren't them. like. I'm not saying I don't ever run corn or have feeders sure. anywhere, sure. but those particular cameras weren't over. Corn yeah, piles. I was just curious, Mike. What would be the odds of a uh, of a uh, Ohio DNR ba uh, banning a cell camera at some point, like some of these other states? Boy, I, again, I I don't see them doing <laughs> anything that that they think might stop people from hunting. We're looking for reasons to encourage people to go hunting, sure. not to quit hunting. So, well, well, I think, dude, uh, I think we've addressed it pretty clearly here. You're losing hunters because yeah. it's way too easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're saying to so then to change the thinking to be if we make it more challenging that we might and we not might not that. We so might challenging that, that you lose them, right? Not not so disabling mm -hmm. to to the point earlier. Like if you have five acres and mm -hmm. you're killing deer right now in Ohio because you have a corn pile in mm -hmm. a cell mm -hmm. camera. If I take mm -hmm. that cell camera away, you still can kill mm -hmm. those deer on that five acres. They're, they didn't yeah. go anywhere. You just are not mm -hmm. observing them, right? You're not crippling yeah. your chance yeah. of killing those deer. You're now mm -hmm. going to have to go out there and sit and hunt, God forbid, but you're going to mm -hmm. have to go do it, sure. which frankly, well, I think it, gets it, you more involved. It, it, in it randomizes the harvest a bit. Well, well, I, well, well let's talk about the, the states that actually, I believe the first state to outlaw wireless trail cameras, I believe was montana montana was. could be wrong yeah montana has sure been they're they're one of the they did it with lighted knocks so yeah montana yeah, was exactly. in a sense utah kansas yeah, on now, public arizona. Now, arizona real quick the boone and crockett club the world record that north american big games world record book right yep you can run a buck down with your truck and enter it in boone and crockett yep but if you have a wireless trail camera photo of it they won't accept it whoa so, so the boone and crockett club used they're headquartered in bozeman montana they used their influence over the Montana DNR to do that, to get that wow. ball rolling, because they feel that wireless trail cameras are cheating. Good for but them. But again, that same organ, <laughs> the same organization. But you hit one with a car; they're all right with that. But, do, but, are, what, but do you, uh, what do you mean by that, Mike? You can't obviously hit a 
You can't hit a deer with oh, a truck. Oh, Boone, Boone and Crockett. Well, you don't yeah, have they'll to take pickups. You don't have to kill a deer to enter in Boone and Crockett. Yeah, really? You can find pickups. it dead in the woods and enter in Boone and Crockett. Yeah, pickups. Okay. Mm-hmm. Boy, Correct. that delegitimizes Correct. it a bit, doesn't it? So, so the Pope and Young Club, for example, I, I, I'm, and I'm just going to get a little philosophical on you. I'm a, I'm a Buckeye Big Buck Club guy, but I, got I, 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 I detached myself <laughs> from, I detached myself from the, from the Pope and Young Club years ago because they used their influence over the Wisconsin DNR to influence crossbows. Now, here's the deal: forget about the crossbow argument, good, bad, whatever. If the Pope and Young Club doesn't want to accept crossbow entries into their records. That's great. Yeah, that's their club. choice. They can yeah. accept you got him with spears, you know, whatever. I, I don't care. But don't use your clout with the DNR and political influence to try to influence what is or is not, what you think is or is not best for the state. Mm-hmm. And so you, getting back to, to uh, the wireless trail cam thing or just trail cams in general, I don't know. I've never, no one's ever posed that question to me. I would really have to give that some thought. But um, I know me personally, I will tell you, if you took, well, here, I think I told you guys a minute ago, I'm on my way to a spot to hunt. <laughs> if it weren't for a wireless trail camera picture last night, yeah. I would be sitting talking to you in my trophy room instead of in my truck. Well, Jeremy and I have had some really, I mean, really deep conversations like in the, in the truck, right. just basically about like, I think, I think bait is, I think we both feel is the number one culprit. That that's the thing that's doing the most damage in the state of but Ohio. Mike's telling me it's not going to ever go away. So I'm trying and to look for I, other I, I, options. I don't, exactly. I don't see it going away. Anytime. I'm put you this way. I don't see it going away anytime soon. Exactly. And so in your, uh, per, you know, per that response, you know, mm-hmm. we're looking for alternatives. We're like, man, if the broad picture objective is to make hunting harder because we think that's the reason people are quitting. It's the reason we have access issues. It's also, t- you know, targeting specific age classes of bucks that we want to live. You know, w- what are the things that can do it? And I think generally the answer is we need to make hunting harder. Uh, well, c- corn piles to me ahead. by far and away are the lowest hanging fruit. Um, if that's not an option, you know, I think that's where Jeremy comes to the, you know, what about cell cameras type of a conclusion. Mm-hmm. Well, let, let me lay this out there for you. Also, you guys do know that there are counties right now in Ohio it's illegal to bait in the in the the, the yeah north the, north the of Columbus. Where, yeah, yeah, where where CWD has been discovered in the wild population. Yep. So those counties are baiting's off limits right now. So you may get your wish anyway because CWD eventually is going to be all over Ohio. Agree. The cat's all the cat's already out of the bag. So as more C, uh, CWD becomes more and more prevalent, more and more counties. Baiting is going to go away for that reason. Now, there's another argument we, we could go off on. Where do I get some time. of that CWD? <laughs> <laughs> Just asking for a friend. Where do I yeah, get some yeah. of that? <laughs> I mean, Mi- Michigan has outlawed baiting twice over the years. Once because of bovine tuberculosis. <laughs> yep. And then they brought baiting back because they realized that, wait a minute, our real problem is deer densities. And our hunters can't kill enough deer without bait. And so they brought it back and then they outlawed it again because of CWD, CWD. Mm-hmm. which, and that's, there's a great argument to be made on both sides of that too, because deer are not dying. So elderly men, once you get past the age of 70, they stop testing PSA for prostate cancer yep. because the odds are, if you're over 70, you, you don't die it. from, you, you die with prostate cancer, not from prostate Correct. cancer. Correct. Yeah. Well, the, the deer are the same way. Deer in the Midwest are not dying from CWD. They're dying with CWD. Mm-hmm. Now, they're dying from EHD. It wipes them out. Yep. It'll go in areas and just devastate them. Yep. But C- CWD is not killing our deer. Yep. And, and an argument I've made for a long time is CWD has been known in Western states like Wyoming and Montana and Colorado. It's been known. It's been there forever, but it's been known for almost 70 years. Mm-hmm. And there are survey populations in areas where they didn't, didn't, didn't reintroduce wolves are booming. Yeah. So if, if CWD was the seventh sign of the apocalypse for the whitetail deer population, uh, the deer in Montana would be all gone right now in the, in, the, in the elk and everything else, except for obviously where they introduce wolves. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I guess my, what I struggle with with CWD is the cat's already out of the bag. And so it's, it's just something we're going to have to learn to live with. And, Here, check and, this and out. Until, go ahead, if, go I ahead. Can, if I can simply, I'm just coming to this conclusion per like all of our yeah. conversation here. It seems like we have a twofold issue. It's like if we, access is what's losing hunters and corn piles opinion, is yes. what's losing yeah. quality of antlered bucks. So if you could, right, am I wrong? No, I, I go ahead. I, yeah. I, I think it's a culture of trying, everybody wanting to kill a trophy bucks. Undoubtedly. Do it, Undoubtedly. That's yeah. definitely a part of it. Yeah. So if we could find a way to regain access for the general public, um, that, that might help the hunter number issue. 
And that may also so. give us an opportunity to address the baiting issue. Mm -hmm. Potentially. Possibly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, Mike. If people hear this podcast or, you know, they're, they're passionate about the issue, frankly, since we've been talking about it, a bunch of people have reached out to us and said, you know, is there an organization? How do I get involved? You know, uh, mm -hmm. How do issues come across your desk? I mean, how can how do you hear from the general public in Ohio? Well, I mean, you can write to the Wildlife Council. We have a, a an email address. You can you can write with your concerns, and we get emails all the time from people concerned about like a hot topic right now is drones, real yep. hot topic, drones. Yep. So I mean, we get a lot of messages, <laughs> and me personally, I get inundated with you know people calls with concerns about whatever, and that's why I, I enjoy talking about this stuff, but. Um, Again, I hear a lot of different sides of it, too. The one thing I will tell you also about all these debates and all this discussion we've had today is there's two sides to all of this, right? So for if, there's no, I guess, easy solution. Well, more than two, right? Yeah, you got a process. bunch of stakeholders. Exactly. 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 Stakeholders. There's a bunch of them. And they have a lot. And everybody's got their own idea of how it should be. Mm -hmm. You know, the Farm Bureau wants this. The insurance companies want that. The, that I wanted the soccer moms want this and the rural hunters want that. And the, you know, and the anti hunters want this. And so there's a lot of people, I actually feel sorry. The division of wildlife is kind of like referees at a sporting event. They throw a flag and somebody in the stadium's mad. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Sure. There is not a change that the division of wildlife can make that doesn't upset somebody somewhere. I mean, we could talk about giving away free money and it's somebody have a problem with it, you know, whatever it's just, there's just no, there's no right answer. That's going to appease everybody. All they can do is the best, with the information that they have and err to the side of what's best for the resource, what's best for future generations and the resource. No doubt. I just want to kill giant bucks, Mike. That's all I want. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a simple man. I just want to, I just want to yeah, shoot you giant go. bucks. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> You're as a, a, there used to be a, an outdoor writer for the, or the info. He was like the uh, media guy for DNR. He referred to the Buckeye big buck club as hetophiles. He said we were hetophiles. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Um, Mike, you mentioned, uh, the ability to write into the wildlife council is, can you share the email yeah. for where people can do that? Uh, I, yeah, I know off the top of my head, I'm sure you can Google it. If you Google Ohio wildlife council, I'm sure it'll come up. Okay. All right. We'll put a link I in the, I, I mean, I never, I've never, I've never written to him myself, so I don't know. Who, who reads those emails? Oh, we do. They come, it comes to all of us. I mean, the, the whole council, when we get emails, they're, they're, they're forwarded on to the entire council. Okay. Mike, before we let you go, any uh, anything big coming up for the 24 season from, from the DNR or the council? Uh, you know, not that I'm aware of. I know, you know, they're going to make – I'm, I'm pretty confident we're going to make sure that our that the DNR stance on drones. And I mean, drones for deer recovery, I'm perfectly fine with, but drones could be used for a lot of different other things that would be – that I think would put cell cams to shame. Sure. I mean, as far as – Oh, you know, absolutely. Making it, making it easy. Yeah. So that that that's going to have to be spelled out very clearly, um, but but no, I don't see anything you know anything too too earth shattering coming up. Uh, I I think there'll be some talk about bobcats. You know that's that'll probably come back up. That was 2018 last time we talked about. Them. I was yeah. I was sitting, a, sitting in a blind the other day, Mike, and I saw I thought of you when we our conversation before. I had a bobcat come out on a cornfield in the same in the same field. Uh, there was. Uh, a mama raccoon and like three babies and i watched the bobcat creep over to him and snag one of the baby raccoons and drag it into the corn <laughs> how about this one of my friends from new hampshire i was telling you about the doe shooters mm -hmm. so he shot a doe and it ran out into a field and he watched it drop so he's gathering up his stuff lowering his bow down and a bobcat ran out in a field and grabbed the bob the the, the doe by the back of the head and started dragging it out of the field. Oh, he, had wow. to get, he had to get down out of the field, run out and yell at the bobcat to scare it away. Jeez. Was trying to, the doe hadn't been dead for 30 seconds. Jeez. Cool. We thought yeah, coyotes they're, they're, were they're bad. An apex predator. Yeah. What's that? We thought coyotes were bad. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I personally, in my part of Ohio, I get almost as many bobcat, if not more, bobcat photos now than I do coyotes. I've been getting oh, a bunch of oh, Megs as we well. We got a pile yeah. of them. Yeah. Yeah, they're very, very, very common. It, 15 years ago, it was like the Loch Ness Monster. You know? yeah. 10 years ago, wow, now don't, don't even slow down. You Crazy. Know, hmm. Yeah, It's interesting well, to see no, them all. They have no natural enemies. Yeah. yeah. It is interesting to see those deer. Uh, there was deer in the field at that time, and none of them were bothered by that bobcat. They just were mm -hmm. just looking mm -hmm. at them. They knew the hip raccoon was alone. They're like, oh, that baby raccoon's screwed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can tell you what, based on what I'm seeing for a lot, a lot, of, a lot of trail camera evidence, so the raccoon population in Ohio is doing okay. Yeah, it's been yeah, undoubtedly. Hmm. Yeah. 
Well, cool. I'm, yeah, I'm good with that, Mike. I appreciate your time. I know you're going to big buck to jump no on problem. there tonight. So well, thanks for having me. Engaging conversation. No, we appreciate it, Mike. Thanks for, for having us on and, and being with us with this. And Hopefully go, it's not the last. Yeah. So we we'll hope to have you back Anytime. in the future. Anytime, guys. Cool. Yeah. Go kill big buck. Thank you. All right, bye. Good luck. All right, bye-bye. See you. Yeah. Bye-bye. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Muddy. Man, Jared, we probably have been using Muddy products for at least 10 years now. It's a long time, dude. It's been a long time. And I can remember when it was simply just safety harnesses and camera arms of all things. And, you know, that's evolved to where you and I both have a bunch of Muddy box blinds as well. I wouldn't say a bunch, but yeah, they, they've come a long way. And certainly the box blinds are, are huge. Shot that buck over your shoulder out of a Muddy box blind a couple years ago. The harness and, and all of the other safety accessories really are, are a major component of, of what Muddy offers for me. Um, you know, we've had some injuries in the past, you know, some, some tree stand accidents. This, this is all back before we were using, uh, you know, frankly, harnesses, mm -hmm. uh, the lineman's belt while we're hanging stuff, and the safe lines. I have those in every single one of, uh, you know, our fixed tree stands now. And uh, so we really have made safety a priority. Uh, that, that's a big deal for us. And, uh, you know, Muddy has everything we need for that. Yeah, and I think uh, the cool thing about Muddy is anyone listening to the Hunter podcast can save 20% using the code HUNTER20. That's H-U-N-T-R-2-0. Uh, anything that you can see on the Muddy Outdoors store online, use that code, save yourself 20% for this hunting season. Go Muddy. Yeah. Ah, boy, that conversation fires me up. First of all, Mike, Mike is a great dude. Like we've talked to him several times, multiple times leading. Dude, he'll just call us and just be like, oh, just, hey, just want to show you this big buck that I saw or that yeah. we recovered. Yeah. And like, so. So really enjoying the the relationship with Mike. There's a, a cool guy. And to hopefully know. Mike gets us involved with Mike Tonkovich, who is the deer program leader in yeah. uh, Ohio to have on the podcast. Yeah. Too. And fun fact, I don't think we dropped earlier, but Mike, I don't know if it's Mike alone or Mike and his sons combined have more entries in the Ohio Big Buck Club than anybody else. In it's the Mike state. and his sons. Yeah. So it's like 50 something, 53, whatever it is. I mean, nobody can look at Mike and be like, oh, this guy in charge doesn't even hunt. He's like the guy freaking hunts. Yeah. Guy, guy hunts, guy kills giant bucks. Um, yeah. And I, you know, and obviously, you know, for us in Pennsylvania, it's, it would be like the head of the commissioners, you know, but Mike's role in, um, the, o the Ohio wildlife council is very critical. It is literally, like he said, the okay. And the no, okay. On, on most rules and legislations come appointed through. by the governor along with seven other members, but he's the chairman mm -hmm. to field address and vote on issues proposed by it sounds like through a general email to the, to the council well i mean a lot of it is coming through from the legislation and from the ohio dnr for them to vote and approve on them yeah so th you know you can write things to them and they could bring it up to the dnr to the legislation like they they become this conduit between you know the political parties and what eventually becomes law for us as the p hunting public yeah which i mean I, and i'll put this like uh staple right here like we're gonna we'll, we'll put the email or the link to the website or whatever mm -hmm. and if, if yeah if you're passionate about these issues in ohio or yeah i mean any issues uh, any yeah. issues in ohio i mean I, I suggest you know we're we know mike personally so i mean mm -hmm. he, he's heard our voice we're gonna continue <laughs> to call him but like yeah write them an email you know what i mean i, I know a lot of you have reached out to us uh on Instagram and stuff, I've seen the messages just about how do we get involved with this organization. And uh, I, I do think there's, uh, you know, there, there's some guys still, still doing some things to sure. kind of just coordinate the movement. But ultimately, uh, Mike and the board of the Ohio Wildlife Council needs to hear from people about, you know, the consequences that we're experiencing as hunters. Yeah, um, th that's that's where the that's where it needs to go. You know, and I think Mike said it pretty well. I don't see baiting going anywhere in Ohio <laughs> anytime soon unless and we've said it before, chronic wasting disease is the push. Or unless we can simultaneously remedy what's why we're losing hunters. Sure. Yeah, because it sounds like the only reason baiting is in place in Ohio's is because we'll lose hunters fast. So, yeah, I mean, you heard, you heard it from Mike directly. The only reason we're not getting rid of baiting is because we acknowledge that it has some, uh, some negative effects, is that people will quit without it. Correct. And I am inclined to believe him. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it comes down to, and this is where, you know, baiting in, in a different states has different effects. In the state of Ohio, when you have small parcel sizes, baiting becomes more important to the, quote, success of hunters because of the small parcel size. has more of an influence. If you're talking about a thousand acre ranches in Texas and stuff, yeah, I mean, baiting is baiting, but it doesn't have near the effect of what it would on a small parcel size in a state like Ohio or Kentucky. Yeah. Um, 
Kansas even, I would say, that baiting in Kansas doesn't have near the effect as it does in Ohio and Kentucky. Completely agree. So, yeah, it's a, it's it's an interesting thing when you start to look at that. Um, it makes me wonder, like, and I know this is I mean, a dude, super fine line. In our One conversation, second. too. Let it, me get this out. Go ahead. One second. Super fine line. If you think of states like Iowa to where I can feed, but I can't bait, mm -hmm. what? where is that compromise in a state like Ohio? Like, let's say you have 10 acres. You could put a feeder out on the 10 acres. You just can't hunt under it, over it. Does that help your cause? Uh, if I heard you right, yes. Yeah. In fact, I would drill it down to it's the gun seasons uh, in Ohio. Directly over a pile. Yep. So if I had a feeder on my five acres, which <clears throat> in effect allowed deer to still be on my property because I have a feeder, mm -hmm. but I'm not directly hunting over that feeder, mm -hmm. is that a compromise? Because that's what Iowa does. I mean, yes, it is. But it, yeah, can you? Is well, well. So what is the what is the is is it is it? Th there's a few different ways to do it. You can do you can say I have to be X amount of yards away from it. And what, yeah, and I don't know what Iowa's. All I know is Iowa is allowed to have feeders out, or as it has long to have been directly. X amount of time has passed. No, like, I, Iowa is a feeder. Like feeder is out, and I'm hunting over here type of thing. There's a lot of nuance to it, but simply put. Guys are killing bucks over corn piles with guns in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And that's what's killing the age class that I'm trying to protect. And it, it, the and I say that because, like, just like anything in life, where's the, where's the happy medium, right? Mm -hmm. Where's the compromise? The problem is, how do you enforce it, right? Okay, cool. Feeder's on my five acres. Check how do you enforce out. the guy not hunting Check this it? out. Truthfully, the good news is most hunters in Ohio today are, quote, unquote, archers. Sure. Okay. So... I don't think that they're doing the most damage. At least it's not the lowest hanging fruit. You don't think that the archers are? Even I, though that they're killing more deer than gun hunters? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I still think that, I mean, again, it's it's my personal experience. So it's mm -hmm. just, it's maybe it's just Columbia and Carroll County. Maybe sure. it's just my farm. I don't know. Sure. Uh, most of our three and four-year-old bucks get killed by neighbors during the youth and opening day of gun season mm -hmm. over corn piles. Interesting. Uh, and those guys... Some hunt with crossbows, some don't. You know, it's there's just much more mixed success. Frankly, it's way harder to kill a deer over a corn pile with a bow or a crossbow mm -hmm. than it is a gun. Way harder. Sure, because you have to be within a much closer distance. Yeah. It'd be the feeding thing. Would it's be it's also the time of year per what we were talking about. Those those bucks are vulnerable the latter half of November and mm -hmm. into the later part of the gun seasons. The feeding thing would be interesting from a compromise standpoint. Basically, you can feed, you can put a corn pile out, but you can't have it within the line of sight of where you're hunting. Mm -hmm. It's so devastating that, I, I mean, if I had to choose between uh, driving and baiting, I'd choose driving. Like driving deer? Yep. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Because, dude, bait, bait just, it just gives you that scenario. Is that illegal in Ohio? Oh, it's legal. Uh, driving deer? Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say. Yeah, right, and I don't know how you make... Sure. Uh, and uh, as a disclaimer to all of this, dude, like you and I are not for government regulation at, at no, all. Like we get accused no. of being like, oh, you guys want, you know, more regulation, more of this and that. And it's like, we don't No, I, And if I thought that we as a community could handle ourselves we can't, to manage the resource, the then that would obviously be what I would. We're, we're completely, we are completely irresponsible to manage it ourselves. Yeah. Can't do it. It's a public resource. It's the tragedy of the commons. It's like story as old as time. We have all this public resource running Which all over private Which is why government land. regulations like this have to potentially exist. It's not that to. we're in favor of it. It's that the tragedy of the commons exists if there is not regulation. The resource has to be protected. It's, it's as simple as that. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, Which is why I laugh. Anytime that... Even in this last clip, we talked about like baiting in Pennsylvania. And they're like, oh, cool. For government regulation. It's like... You got drugs, dude? Like, if you just let people do whatever they did, there will be no deer. Mm -hmm. Somebody will go out with a spotlight and shoot deer every night that they can. You have to have law and order. I mean, you just, you have to have a, a structure. You have to have, you have to have, um... There are people listening to this that don't think that you do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah, trust me. Look at third, third world countries. I mean, look at places that don't have laws or mm -hmm. ways to enforce them. That's, mm -hmm. that's what you would deal with in the Whitetail Woods. Yeah. Yeah, that's a stupid argument. Yeah, you, you have to have rules. Mm -hmm. You have to have regulation. You have to manage the resource. It's no different than this opportunity thing we're talking about. It's like, okay, e people can look at that and say, well, you want more laws. You want corn piles regulated. You want ca cameras regulated. You know, whatever. You want no crossbows. The fact is, it's because it's a shared resource that is, is if you open up 
all of those opportunities, there is no resource left. It's gone. Yeah. Well, and we've used the example before, but it's as simple as like, you know, guys want to say, well, as long as it's legal by any legal means, it's like, okay, if tomorrow Mike Rex said, Hey, you know, rig up, you know, rig up some sort of 50 caliber machine gun to your thermal drone and how about it? You know what I mean? There's no, and there'd be people who did it. Absolutely. People would go murder every deer that existed. It would happen. I Cause they don't care about the resource. Yeah. I could guarantee you. And they'd have fun for a short period of time and then it'd be over and then all deer would be and gone. And they would move on to something else. Meanwhile, all the people who cared about the resource would be devastated. Yeah. And so this by any legal means thing is like, uh, it's in my nature to, to question things. Right. And sure. inherently like my mom will tell you, I'm a, I'm a rule breaker. Right. But it, not not to this day, right? I respect law, yeah. but like I'm not going to just say yeah by any legal means because I'm not dumb enough to see that the technology's not it's changing. It's evolving and we're not adapting. No. No, we're not. And and that's where I'm confused on the and we we talked about this maybe off podcast is that we have less hunters than we've had according to everybody. According less, to everybody. Less hunters than we've ever had most people would tell you that they think that there are less deer than there have been in a long time. Not ever, right? Because back in the 70s and 60s and yeah, stuff. Yeah, and not necessarily in Ohio, but generally speaking, that seems to be and, the consensus. In certain places, and yeah. maybe it's EHD and other things that are contributing mm-hmm. to it. So, you know, look at those kind of aspects. We are the most lethal we've ever been. By far and away. Yeah, undoubtedly the most lethal. I, I, and I'll... Yeah, I mean, it sounds like, I don't know, pompous or it sounds bad, but like, dude, killing bucks in Ohio is easy. It's super easy. So if that's the case, why do we have to make hunting harder? What do you mean? Because it's easy. No, because people aren't having success. That's why Mike's fearing oh, yeah, they are. removal of corn piles. No, no, no. Yeah, well, people are having success. I don't think that they are. Oh, yeah, they are. What I do you mean? My, Mike's fear of removing a corn pile yep. is saying that somebody can't have they, it, it would make it so hard that they couldn't kill deer, mm-hmm. okay? Well, yeah, that's because it's so easy now. All I have to do is go out, dump my corn pile, sit 100 yards away. If I remove that, the question, okay, now so there's the what do I do? How do I actually hunt? That's the statistic we're missing is of the whatever, 400,000 deer hunters in Pennsylvania or in Ohio. How many would quit if we how, got rid of bait? Well, not even that. How many of them are successful every year right now? Mm. What uh, is, what's, can we look that what's up? What's the average... You know, because I think the there's... The success rate? Was Can you do Ohio... Two, three 300,000 deer killed? So is it yeah. really 75% success? No, because it's... it was like 50. Certain people kill multiple deer. It's hard to say, though, because the tag allocation accounts for, like, antlerless as well. Sure. So because it's like, you could technically look at and say, I'm, I've only killed one of my three... No, I've killed none. I've killed none. I've killed no deer in Ohio this year. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm... Yeah. Not successful. Not successful. I'm an unsuccessful person. Better get a corn pal out. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the reality is like, I, I know for a fact, I yeah. know for a fact that if I had gone out of there's some choice gone, in that unsuccessful side. Absolutely. Though. You passed here. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's where it's, I, I don't think, um, I think there are people that looking for just success rates, uh, in, in Ohio. Nick. Yeah. Cause I would, okay. you know, if you think about like the guy who's got 10 acres to hunt and a corn pal, is he successful every year? Yeah. I would assume he's not. And no, that, he is. I know him. Uh, <laughs> I know a bunch of them. Yeah, but I would assume there's a lot of unsuccessful people there. Not not for <laughs> not for lack of opportunity, for lack of effort. Sure. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be an odd of unsuccess, for sure. I think they would be more successful, and th- this is kind of counterintuitive what we just talked about, but talking through it now, I think that they would be more successful if you took away trail cameras because they'd sure. have to sit there They'd longer. be more likely to shoot. They'd have to sit there longer. They'd have to spend more time in the tree stand. Can't kill them if you're on the couch. If you took away the camera. Yeah, but they're there. I mean, what do you mean? You you go out in the evening and deer show up on the corn file. That's what happens. I don't know, man. I don't... uh, Case in point, Monday, Carter and I were out there first day of gun. We corn piles all over the place. I didn't see shit. (laughs) Yeah. I mean... I, I didn't. And I again, I heard a dozen shots. On the opening day gun season? In Kentucky. No, that was in Ohio. In Ohio. Yeah. Well, certainly it's, it's, uh, we, we've used the word anecdotal a lot in this podcast. I don't know. If Mike that's, has. <laughs> I don't know if that's the correct word or not, but like, <clears throat> yeah. You know, just, just use the t- statistic. I mean, there's a regional variance. I'm to confident it. it's no less than 80% of deer are getting killed on corn piles in Ohio. I would say that they, I think it's closer I, to I 90. would say corn piles have an effect on 80% of the deer. I wouldn't say that they're necessarily being killed on a corn pile. Meaning, like, if I've got a feeder in the bottom and I'm hunting a top, 
I killed that deer because he was heading to the feeder type of thing. Yeah, but if you have corn out, people are they hunt their corn piles. That's what you do. And you're dumb if you're not because that's where they're going. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, I've made that mistake. Uh, I mean, dude, you and I will sit here. Agree and disagree. You and I, I will sit here as guys that have baited for years in Ohio, sure. in Ohio yes. right? <clears throat> and um, I've made the mistake of sitting just, just a little too far away from the corn pile mm-hmm. thinking I'll kill them coming in. Mm-hmm. That was dumb. I should have sat on the corn pile and killed five more of them probably. They're going to that corn pile, you know, with varying degrees of success. You know, mm-hmm. and certainly, you know, big bucks are still big bucks. They're they're wary, and there's certain sure. times of year that they don't want to be in there. But, I mean, you, you get in there in a in a sub to 20, 30 degree day after it's been there for he's common, yeah, guaranteed, yeah. You know, or you get in there, you know, youth gun season that third week of November, and you got a hot doe that pulls him in there. He's common. Mm-hmm. I think that's why I target the corn pile thing so much more. I'm very open to your self. I, and I think most well, of what you're it, saying is true. I'm not arguing that corn piles aren't the, the most influential. Yeah. I'm just saying yeah. that everybody's telling us it can't happen. Right, right, right. So I, I get it. I don't want to give up. What's another option? Yep. And frankly, cameras are probably more <clears throat> of a sacrifice from the anti baiting structure than it is the baiting structure. They absolutely are. Almost, it, there's, boy. I mean, it's a bigger sacrifice from the guys who are, you know, managing property and managing deer than it is the guy who has a bait pile out trying to kill a deer. It definitely is. You're right. And, you know, if we care about the resource more, then I'm okay with that. I'm willing to make a sacrifice. Yeah. My question, the the unknown about that is like, will it achieve the desired result? Like, I can see how it will, it how would, it might. It may not achieve. I know you think everything. It will. <laughs> well, and here's the other thing. And I was interested. I can't believe that Mike said that he doesn't think the non-hunting public would believe baiting is cheating, because that growing up in Pennsylvania, baiting was cheating. Yeah, it is cheating. Well, people people know deep down. Like, dude, you. I asked a guy straight up at the taxidermist. He brought this buck in. Yeah. And I said. Because I'm not shy, but I said, you sure. shoot it over corn pile? He goes, well, well small, small pile of corn. Well, it's the, <laughs> like, it's the cultural okay. thing, right? If you, if you ask... Guys are no- embarrassed about it. Dude, I, it, it wasn't long ago. It was like 10 years ago. Guys were hiding them, like on Outdoor Channel and stuff. Oh, they still They are. would hide it. because They're they still didn't, hiding them. Yeah. Yeah, behind yeah, oh, logs sure. and in brush yeah, and yeah. Photoshop. They don't want people to know. Because so, it's like a little dirty thing. If you ask somebody from a non-bait state, is baiting cheating? Hundred percent, yes. Hundred mm-hmm. percent, every time. Yep, it is. You ask them from a bait state, you get mixed answers, right? So, what I think is interesting there is, I thought Mike would say that the non-hunting public would agree that baiting is cheating because they're unfamiliar with how hunting is. Um, I think that the non-hunting public would also, if you said, "Hey, uh, are you in support of us banning trail cameras?" and the non-hunting public, well, what do you mean? Like, oh, everybody's having these cameras out you know, monitoring, they'd say from a privacy side, yeah, I'm in favor of banning those. See, I don't think so. I I don't think they would have, I think inherently just human beings, like non-hunting public, I think they're going to be more inclined to have an issue with baiting because they're going to say- They're the ones who got rid of the cameras in Kansas though. And in some of these other states. Yeah, but those were users. Privacy. Right, right. Yeah, that doesn't have, on private land though, that's not an issue. Sure. As much, right? I'm just saying inherently, yeah, right, and wrong, good and evil. Yeah. You ask somebody, you know, is is bait, they'd say they wouldn't want is, them on public land then for sure. sure. And I'm open to that. Yeah, it is a privacy violation to some degree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's public land. I get mm-hmm. it. It's, it's kind of dumb, but I get, I get it. it. I get it. Right? I mean, we all look around when we we take shit in the woods now. You better. <laughs> you better. Yeah, I will say, dude. One pro for trail cameras, major deterrent for trespassing. Uh, I mean, I probably position the cameras that I have running in some of my places are positioned for trespassers more than they are for deer. Yeah. Cause, or dogs. Yeah. Major, major turn there. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> non collared ones. Who, who let the dogs out? Yeah. I found a dog skull what? the other day. Yeah, an old one, I'm pretty sure. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was like a. That bear. was one in Illinois. Yeah. Yeah, Carl. Yeah. I, I like showed it to the guy. I was like, dude, what is this? He goes, hmm. He's like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting conversation with Mike. Like you and I, I think are in the same turn. Like you sense my ambiguity towards your conversation around trail cameras. Like there's, it's a, it would be, yes. yeah. And I think we both agree. You know, scorn piles are creating a lot of problems, but they're the thing that's like plugging the hole from us losing a bunch more hunters. Absolutely. 
Yeah, it, it is not the it is not the save all by any means, but it's plugging the whole. So I get Mike's tone on the the vote side. Um, but to your point, I also don't know. I don't know how many hunters we're losing a year already, and I don't know. It's one of those things that like okay, we're we're not succeeding as we sit right now. Yeah. Right. If we change something, it could be worse. It also could be better. Mm-hmm. We don't know until we change something. And at this point, it, it nobody wants to change anything. Nobody wants to touch it. Right. It's like they're acting like if it's not broke, don't fix it, but it is broke. It's broke. Um well, it's 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 broke from a political sense. I mean, that's we don't have as firm of a grasp on that. I mean, like if I, I could negligibly say, you know, and I have probably said at some point, I'm like, dude, the, the worst part about hunting is that other people do it. Cause they, sure. you know, because it's like, boy, everybody's experienced it. You know, you drive around during November and it's like, holy cow, freaking people everywhere. everywhere. You know, you yeah. see, you know, which is the, that is the part that I'm still struggling. With. You know? And so, so one part of you would say, you know, per this whole argument, you'd be like, great. Who care? You know, we lose hunters. Fine. You know, that's your Matt Ranella argument. You know, he's very adamant. He's like, we have too many hunters and we're not fully on that board. Certainly no, I, I and, want, and Matt's is a lot on public land, which it's like, yeah, it's yeah. public land. Do what you want. Yeah. 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 But you know, Mike is sitting there saying we need votes. Basically we, you know, we need some strength and you know, Don Higgins comes to mind, you know, he's one who's very adamantly like, Hey, I was involved in this in Illinois. Let me tell you, we don't have any pull as hunters to begin with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm inclined. I'm made. inclined to believe him. I mean, yeah. It, there's the the rebel in me wants to be like, what are they going to do? You know what I mean? Are, sure. You're going to well, it's just like the say second there's amendment. no gun season. You're yeah, gonna, what are you going to do? Take away my guns? Get the fuck out of here. Well, I think what they would do. I literally, if I mean, not to give anybody any ideas, but sure. like, it seems like they'd find a way to justify termination of deer completely. That they would just kill the resource? Mm-hmm. I don't think that would ever happen. No? No. You don't think something like CWD or a disease could get to a point where the anti-hunting public just said, hey, we need to terminate these. No, because they care about the deer more than they care about us. They'd rather terminate the hunter than they would the deer. They'd rather shoot you than shoot the deer. 100%. They value well, that. Well, but that's they, not an option. They can't they'd shoot us, so... I'm just I'm just saying the anti hunter values the deer's life more than they value your life. Yeah. That's the whole mindset. Well, okay, so there's anti- That's why they're not. There's anti hunters as a specific thing, but then there's just corporations. You know what I mean? Okay. You just call that the lobbyist mid- corporations like insurance companies and stuff. Yeah, just yep. co- just corporations. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. Those people have no interest in a wildlife resource. None. Uh probably not. And no interest in hunting either as probably a Probably not. You so, know what I mean? But what's the why would they get rid of them? Um, what's their gain there? I don't know. Maybe they have a similar policy agenda as a non, maybe the non-hunting group goes to this, you know, I don't think the non-hunting group wants to get rid of deer. I think they like seeing them. They don't like hitting them with cars, but they, they like seeing wildlife. That's, that's the weird thing is the non-hunting group loves wildlife and the outdoors. They don't, that's where they're on the teetering edge of like, they're not opposed to hunting, but they surely don't like to see a dead deer get, you know, shot. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we're we're kind of like bl- I don't think blindly anybody, guessing who's the threat. You know what I mean? Like, well, the threat would be that they remove hunting and in place they put sharpshooters and controlled corporations and to kill the deer to keep populations okay. in check. So they've done that in northern Missouri because of the CWD thing. Yeah, and I I don't know. I've been trying to learn more about this since we've had some of these talks. I don't know how many of those. Sounds like a bunch of those were volunteered farms. Um, sure. and some of those, so I don't know if they force their way into anyone's property. No. So just like what we just talked about, like irrelevant though. I mean, are you going to come on to my property and kill my deer? No, but they can go it on a ten of your neighbors. Sure. Yeah. Which, yeah. You know, if, if you have something as deadly as a corn pile, you don't need all the property. Well, then I'll access. put more corn piles. <laughs> I wish it worked that way. I really do. I mean, am I going to protect all the deer? No. But I protect some of the deer. For a period of time. Well, and then it becomes a who can dump more corn over uh, the, the point, resources of the United States government or whoever, you know. Here, Here's where <laughs> I think the weird thing is. And again, I don't know um, I don't know how this will affect hunter numbers. But, but taking Ohio as an example, Illinois as another example. 
and I don't mean anything about this because we do this. We've, we've done this in the past. Um, I, I really think that hunting leases has created the issue. It's a, I mean, due to access, I, I, I hunting it, leasing I it has, out there. has created a, an issue that is almost overlooked for some reason. And I don't know why. Like It's, it's not. It's access. I mean, the reason. It's, it's the number one, it's the number one, uh, whatever, attacker, like, uh, reason that we're losing access yeah, is, and, is leasing. Well, and what's weird about it is like, you know, obviously I buy land for a lot of different reasons, hunting being one of those, investment being another, but it probably wouldn't be nearly as good as an investment, nor do I know if I'd use it for hunting if n everything around me wasn't being leased. You see what I'm saying there? No, say that again. So I buy a piece of ground, let's say my ground in Southern Ohio, I bought it as an investment mm -hmm. and I bought it for hunting. Mm -hmm. Okay. If and that's because hunting access is limited. Mm -hmm. If there was no leasing, okay, the hunting value of that property probably wouldn't be as great as it is now because there'd be places to hunt around it. There'd mm -hmm. be access. Yep. The investment side of it may not be nearly as good because the demand for land would be much less, mm -hmm. thus the value being lower. Yep. So the hunting lease has affected people to buy land yep. and lock it up has affected people to lease land and lock it up. And yep. for it's it's one of the bigger culprits here. Definitely. It's one of the means of acquiring land. Yeah, I mean, so you could run it. One is buy it. One, and to it, Mike's one point, is lease it and one is get permission. Those are your three tiers. And to Mike's point, in a capitalist society, I don't know how you change that, mm -hmm. you know, to, to the point of like, oh, well, Ohio DNR is going to open it. No, no, no. All that's going to do is drive prices up. Mm -hmm. It's a great program. It's a great thought. Let me pay landowners to incentivize them to open it up to public. But ultimately, that's just going to drive leasing prices up because somebody's going to say, okay, would they pay 30? I'll pay 50 an acre. Right. I don't know. Yeah, it's like you're essentially competing against capitalism. I, I don't and know. And you won't stop it. I don't know if there's a different way to do it. Like, I, I don't think dollar for dollar you're going to outrun it. I wonder if you could you know, if there was enough incentive that you could offer, like in form of tax break or... Well, the big things that we've talked about, and I'm I'm not saying I'm in favor of these. The big things we talked about is if you get any federal funding or assistance, you should have your have to be forced to have your land open to the public. Mm -hmm. So for our case... Not forced. I mean, that, that would be the option you choose. CRP. Yep. If you're in CRP and you're getting payments, your property is open to public hunting. Yes, but you also don't want to deter people from having a positive influence on the habitat. In I'm, I'm, yeah, devil's advocate yeah. of like how these things all work. But what I'm saying is there has to be a solution to slowing the demand for land. And and I don't. Th I think that leasing is the one thing that's driving purchasing of recreational land up. I think that it's also driving less and less access because everything's just getting leased. They're in a ca capitalist environment. You paid 50, I'll pay 60. You paid 70, I'll pay a hundred. It will never stop. Yep. Right. It, it, there is no top. Yeah. Well, on it. There's we, always, uh, there's always somebody that will pay more for it. We've reached this point in the conversation before. And I think ultimately what we figured out was that it makes way more sense to try to fix the resource on the land Agreed. than it does to make more land. You can't make more land and you can't make less hunters. We can't have either of those. You don't want to have either of those. What you can have is a more plentiful resource on the land that does exist for the people that are currently hunting them. Or that's you make, that's where the removal of corn piles comes in. Or you make it tougher for them to monitor and hunt the deer on the resource. Yeah, make it harder. What, what, doesn't matter. What, whatever makes them harder to kill mm -hmm. improves the quality of the resource. You see my point, though? I do, If you Absolutely. remove cameras, how... Like if I went out, if I'm an outfitter, I can't lease 10,000 acres without camera. I can't effectively manage and scout and hunt and do any of that without cameras. Well, you wouldn't need to. You could probably like have just as good a success on half the amount of land over a certain period of time. Save more money and you would free up land to other people. Yeah, I agree. It, it, I'm not saying that it's the best compromise here, but in the world of solutions, I do think, and I've said it before and people shit all over it. I do think that baiting will get banned here. Eventually mm -hmm. CWD will ban baiting. Yeah. And, in, in every state that's out there, which is interesting even to, cause Mike told us straight up. He's like, that's bullshit. Like, yep. you know, it, it has nothing to do with it. Basically. It's going to happen. You know, he, he's on the side of like, and I would tend to agree, you know, he's like, uh, the corn piles are not the reason CWD is spreading. It's certainly congregating deer. And Mike's not but, wrong in, in the fact that deer aren't dying from CWD. They're dying from other things. Yes. Yeah, very no nonsense. Yep.
So, but uh, I do believe. No nonsense. I do believe that CWD will ban baiting in every state that whitetails exist. Sure. At some point. Well, that'd be great. I mean, that would be it's one gonna, very positive outcome of CWD. Could be 20 years from now, though. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, right. What What's going to happen between now and then? Or pose this question, and I know Mike can't necessarily answer it for us, but at what point have we do we lose hunters year after year that we might as well just pull the plug anyways? Exactly. Well, and uh, are we there? I don't know. Are we not there yet? Yeah. I, I, dude, it's, for me, it's clear as day. He's right. If you, if you get rid of baiting, you're going to lose hunters in Ohio. However, you're losing hunters right now because you're continuing to allow it, along with <coughs> these other things that we've talked so about. So here's my thought. <clears throat> Just because as a non-resident landowner, I can't do it from the state of Pennsylvania, but clearly a lot of landowners in Ohio are not buying licenses. Yep. They don't have to. Yep. A lot of non-resident landowners in reciprocal states to Ohio also don't have to buy a license. Say again? So there are certain non-resident states yep. uh, or non-residents that don't have to buy a license in Ohio because if an Ohio person owns ground in their state, they also don't buy it. It's called reciprocal license states. Pennsylvania is not one of them. So as a Pennsylvania resident... I'm not following you. Okay. I own land in Ohio. Yep. You as, have to buy a license. As a Pennsylvania resident. Yep. But I, I don't know what Indiana, for example, mm -hmm. doesn't have to buy an Ohio license because if an Ohio person owns land in Indiana, they also don't have to buy a license. It's called recipro reciprocation. You follow me? I don't think that's right. It is. 100%. I called them. I think you have to live in the state. Nope. You do not. There's non, nope. You th do. There are non resident landowner tags in reciprocal states. Okay. Yep. Well, so nobody quote us on this, right? Because I. I'm not allowed. Because you're to, a Pennsylvania resident. Yep. Pennsylvania doesn't honor Ohio people owning land in Pennsylvania. Okay. That's, but if I lived in Indiana? Yep. You'd be good. Oh, that's dumb. Nope. It's just how the states work. Okay. Yep. So what? what? I, yeah. I could be a resident of Indiana and own land. I think Indi it's Indiana, in Michigan. Ohio. There's several And of not them. buy a license and go hunt there. If you own land. That's dumb. That makes no sense. It's just like if you're a non-resident landowner in Kansas of 80 acres or more, you don't need to get a permit. You can hunt it. You don't have to get a permit? No. That's dumb, too. You're a non-resident landowner. Oh, my word. What are we doing? So what I'm saying is... Taking, you still have to get a license to hunt I, land in Kansas that you I don't you own. think you do. Nobody quote us on any of this. We don't know what we're I don't think about. you do. <laughs> it's non-resident... Um, non-resident... Landowner, Kansas hunting. I think it's 80 acres. I think you're right about that. Yep. Uh, a permit is valid only for lands owned and operated by the landowner or the tenant. A non-resident hunting with this permit must have a non-resident hunting license. Yep. But you don't need a deer permit. Okay. So you don't have to buy a deer permit. Okay. 80 acres. One per 80 acres. Okay. So you get a permit for, for free. free. Yeah, but you got to buy your license. You have to buy a non-resident hunting license. Okay. In Ohio, I don't think you need anything. So where were we going with that? So where I'm going with that is, do we actually think that hunting numbers are decreasing or are people just not buying licenses because they don't have to? Mm. Uh, I don't know. I'm baffled. Like, because... Think every, of the number of landowners in Ohio who hunt who don't need a license. Your dad. Well, that also makes me think, like, you know, because I hear from Mike, it's like, you know, non-residents foot 57% of the license bill. But also, resident landowners don't have to pay anything for license. And they are the ones with gripes about the baiting situation. Mm -hmm. So, I feel like I could be wrong. I feel like resident landowners would be willing to pay buy a license. And along with that, you could... You know, that would justify the removal. Here's of the your baiting. exemptions. Can I read these to yeah. you? Yeah. Ohio resident landowners, spouses, and their children are not required to have a hunting license, fur taker permit, either sex deer permit, antlerless deer permit, spring or fall turkey permit, or Ohio wetlands or habitat stamp when hunting or trapping the land they own. They don't need any. Mm -hmm. So family of four, yep. no hunting license. Does it go on to say about like, so I live out of state, I think is what disqualifies me. Uh, I don't, it doesn't say that right now. Okay. Uh, a non-resident landowner 
and the spouse and children living with that landowner. Living with that landowner. There you go. Non-resident. Yeah. Yep. May hunt on that property without a license, either sex deer permit, antlers deer permit, blah, 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 blah. So if I moved back and land lived with my parents, I wouldn't have to buy a license in Ohio. Correct. Uh, If that non-resident's home state allows residents of Ohio owning property in the non-resident's home state and the spouse, blah, 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 to hunt without the permit. So that's where Pennsylvania doesn't qualify. That reciprocity needs to go. Yep. There's no reason. A for member that. of a limited liability company or partnership is a landowner provided the member is an Ohio resident and a limited liability company or partnership consists of three or three fewer individuals. Uh, they don't need a license. Yeah. Tenants and their children own land in which they reside uh, and derive more than 50% of their income from agricultural production. That's a large portion of, of people and don't need one. Mm-hmm. Ohio resident landowners, grandchildren, who are under 18 years of age are not required to have a hunting license or wetlands permit while hunting the grandparents' land and then members of your U.S. Armed Forces. Well, there you go. You know, Mike, it, when you listen to this, Mike, you're giving all your licenses away for free. There's I mean, a that's, ton that, of people that's there. Of <laughs> that's a ton of people. And at the people. same time, dude, as a non-resident, I have to, and I'm not necessarily great because I do think non-residents should have to pay more. It's, mm-hmm. It cost me $76 per for either no tag. sex tag. Yeah, it, which includes doe. So if I want to shoot five does, it's going to cost me $76 each. Yep. Plus our our deer permit is like, or our know. non-resident one is two like two hundred bucks. Yeah. So keep that in mind. Mike's saying what over fifty percent of the license revenue generated is from non-residents. Right. There is also a large section of non-residents who own land in Ohio who don't need a license. They don't have to buy one. Per this. Oh, they don't. Because remember the reciprocity. Yeah, and that can't be a large number. I bet it is. Okay. It, uh, basically, as long as it's not Pennsylvania, it sounds like. Okay. Well, I think most deer hunters that travel to Ohio come from the east. Michigan. Or the north. Michigan is a large. Is Michigan on the list? southern Ohio. Yep, I think so. And southern Ohio is a huge source of, like, everybody in the south. Hmm. Maybe. Lots. I think it's I, a, I think it's Pennsylvania. I think so Pennsylvania how, is number one. I guess my question is how do you how do you keep telling us that these are the number changes in licenses when Yeah, clearly that's a dynamic, we have a large that's a dynamic change. Well, they there still are statistics, right? Like do they still have to uh, check them? Check deer. I don't know how how do you check deer with no confirmation code? Well, you get the confirmation code but based on a license. license number which you don't have. I don't know. Somebody, uh, there's probably a method for it, I'm going to assume. I assume you have to check a deer. Yeah. I don't know, man. The, it, you know, this is where, and Mike was right, when people talk about predicting, st- like, deer numbers in the state, like, at one point, Pennsylvania had 1.7 million deer. They had no freaking idea. There's no way. It's just, it's statistics. Here's how many deer were harvested. Here's how many hunters, success rates, historical trends. Pfft, spits out a number that's completely bullshit. That's just how it is. Nick, have you seen that guess my fart thing? Yeah, I have. <laughs> Did that not remind you what he Was just, that good? Have you seen that? No. It was a good representation. Some people say guess my fart and then they go and then they actually fart. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Sorry. My, my bra- brain's a little fried after this. Mine would, probably, mine would probably sound wetter. I was just going to throw it out there. Um, but yeah, so I don't think that you can follow those trends and track with all these variables that are just out. Yeah, they're variables. out the window on yeah. this stuff. So I don't know. I mean, it just seems like. We- I would love to know. I would love to have a poll from the general public. Who's for baiting? Who's we can it, do it. Who's against baiting? And my, you know, the follow-up question to. I'm sure they have To done Mike it. and to, to the state them. is like, who, who do you, whose opinion do you value? Is it the landowners in Ohio? Like, I don't know. seems like they're kind of being negated at this point. Is it the non-residents? seems like they I have mean, a lot of pull. Non-residents are funding the yeah, DNR, seems like right? they have a lot of pull. Is it resident hunters that don't own land? You know, where do they fall into the mix? I and, mean, you can't, uh, the, the crazy thing is, is like, it seems like you can't, you can't rely on the non-residents to dictate what happens in the state that they don't live in, but they're funding the license fees. Well, that's where I'm kind of trying to tease out. Like, is it the numbers or is it the money, which is more important? Or, or do, do we need them both? You know, because it's like yeah, non-residents can't vote, 
right? So Correct. when Mike says it's the voters that we need, that's your residents. Resident hunters. And a lot of your residents own land. Yeah. And those are the people that are pissed off about baiting. And also not buying a license. And also not buying a license. Yeah, and I mean, so Ohio residents have it pretty good from a license standpoint, but they're getting screwed because non-residents are hunting all their borders with corn piles. And are those non-residents owning land or are they leasing land? I'm going to say overwhelmingly they're leasing. Which is a, the problem. Overwhelmingly. that I would say that is why most of the residents are being displaced. A lot of, a lot of residents that don't own land. Uh, Probably hunted by permission. I mean, that's how hunting. I grew up. Yeah. I grew up they hunting are. permission. Yeah, we didn't a lot land. of them are still hunting by permission. Um, Not anymore. It's getting leased. Because the guy's saying, hey, listen, sorry, this guy offered me $5,000 for a 50-acre pasture. I don't know. Like a lot, So, like, right where we're at, most of our neighbors are landowners. Yep. And their kids hunt it or people hunt it on permission. Mm-hmm. There was some leasing that happened for a while. Yeah, but not a lot. But not, not a ton. M- most mm-hmm. of them are resident landowners and their immediate family and... Uh, and permission people. And see where I'm at, it's leases and outfitters. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty different. Like, I mean, there's a few of us that own land, but it's primarily leases and outfitters around me. Interesting. Yeah. I'd love to know. I'd love to, if you could see a pie chart of a, amount of land, how it's owned or, mm-hmm. and then how it's occupied by hunters. Cause I'm sure people listening to this, it does seem like every freaking piece of ground is being hunted. I'm not crazy. Yeah. Everywhere you go, I'm like, holy cow, like freaking everywhere I look. Yeah. It sure doesn't seem like we have less hunters than we ever have. Yeah. And that's what I don't understand. And to some, in some places, there for sure seems like less deer than they've ever had, mm-hmm. you know, up until, you know, let's say the 90s or something. Yeah. So it's like, how do you have less hunters and less deer? That doesn't make any sense. Nick. <laughs> I, uh, I I don't know, know, man. There's certainly some question marks, like still here, you know. I, yeah. So, well, anyways, yeah, we'll continue to hash that out. I mean, I guess we'll, we'll leave you with great conversation with Mike. You know, we're still yeah. We'll try to get so, Tonkovich on. Um, Tonkovich that would be, would be good cool. on the biology side. Probably more factual numbers and stuff on trends and things. Would love to hear from Mike that a bunch of you guys wrote the email address that we're going to leave here sure. in the link. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Um, don't know if it'll do anything, but I mean, it can't hurt to You're share your You're at least sending it to opinion. the right people. Yeah. So. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, we appreciate everybody listening to this episode of uh, Hunter Podcast 159. Mm-hmm. Yeah. With Mike Rex, which um, Mike Rex, the big buck kill- killer. Yeah, yeah. Like Ohio buck killer, as he <laughs> likes to be named. So, um, and we'll catch you next week. Yep. Later. It's take me over.